the House Ways and Means Committee, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of COVID-19 pandemic, and in accordance with the House Rule 67 and the governor's emergency order number 12, pursuant to Executive Order 2020-04, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. This is a public hearing of bills referred to the Ways and Means Committee. Executive sessions on pending legislations may be held. Please note that there is no physical location for members of the public to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting. However, in accordance with emergency order, I am confirming that all members of the committee and select legislative staff have the ability to communicate contemporaneously during this meeting through the Zoom electronic meeting platform. And the public has access to contemporaneously listen and if necessary, participate in this meeting by the Zoom platform or by telephone. All necessary access information has been made available in the House calendar and through the electronic calendar on the general court website. The notice for this meeting applies with House Rules RSA 91A. Anyone who has a problem accessing the meeting should call 271-3600 or email hcs at leg.state.nh.us. Okay. Anyone who has a problem accessing the meeting should call 271-3600 or email hcs at lake.state.nh.us. In the event the public is unable is unable to access the meeting, the meeting will be adjourned and rescheduled. I want to introduce the staff that are on the meeting assisting us, which consists of Jennifer Floor, the committee researcher. Please note that all votes that are taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote. Let's start the meeting by taking a roll call attendance. When each member states their presence, please also state whether there is anyone in the room with you during this meeting, which is required under the right to know law. Representative Bernstein, uh, Paul Roll. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let's begin the roll call with Representative Patrick Abrami. Present. Here at the State House. Representative Mary Griffin. Uh, present. I'm at my home alone in Windham. Representative Ullery. Present at home alone. Representative be. Russell Ober. Present at home with six cats. My wife will be returning soon. <laughs> Very yeah. good. Representative Fred Doucette. Present. Representative Burstein is your clerk today, and I'm here in concert. Representative Robert Elliott. Representative Elliott. We saw him earlier, right? Yeah. Present, and my wife's in the bedroom. Do you hear me? Yes, thank you. Representative Janigian. Present at home, Salem, New Hampshire, with my wife and daughter somewhere in the house. Representative Herschel Nunez. Uh, Nunez, and I am here in conference. Representative Tim Baxter. Uh, Tim had said he'll be late. We'll get back to him. Representative Walter Spillsbury. Representative Spillsbury. Representative Paul Tudor. Here in Northwood in the cellar alone, wife and grandkids upstairs. Thank you. Representative Susan Almi. Representative Almi. Representative Richard Ames. I'm here in Jeffrey alone in my home office and Susan Army, Representative Army will be uh, late. Thank you. Representative Thomas Southworth. 
Representative Southworth, I'm here alone in Dover. Representative Dennis Malloy. This is uh, Dennis Malloy in Greenland, New Hampshire, and my spouse is in the house. President. Representative Thomas Schamberg. Uh, Representative Schamberg here at the LOB committee room. Representative Edith Tucker. Representative Tucker. Representative Gomarlo. I'm here in Swansea alone. Representative Thomas Laughman. Representative Laughman. Representative Amanda Gord. Here in my home office in Lee by myself. Representative Mary Hacken Phillips. Present this morning for my office in Concord alone. Representative James Murphy. Jim Murphy here in Hanover with my wife and daughter elsewhere in the home. Representative Norm Major. Present here at the LLB. Let's go back. Uh, Representative Tim Baxter. Representative Walter Stillsbury. Yeah. Excellent. So uh, let's see, 20 of us are here, three of us aren't. Thank you. We have a busy schedule today. We will start off with house a public hearing on House Bill 533, which is an act establishing a division of investigation and compliance in the Lottery Commission. The prime sponsor is Representative Romney. Representative Romney is going to introduce this bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Can we just do a sound check? Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. I'm kind of an awkward here. I'm halfway between where everybody's sitting and the camera. You'll see my profile. Uh, my words are more important than the profile, that's for sure. Uh, I'm here to introduce, oh, first off, State Rep. Pat Abrami, for the record, uh, Rockingham 19, Stratum, New Hampshire. I'm here to introduce House Bill 533, establishing a division of investigation and compliance in the Lottery Commission. I filed this bill at the request of Charlie McIntyre, the executive director of the lottery. This bill uh, does four things. Uh, first, it formally creates a division of investigation and compliance within the lottery commission. The bill creates a structure, really a structure only, to be staffed by existing employees. This bill does not ask for additional staff. It's very important to understand that. In doing so, it clearly outlines the duties of investigation and compliance. Again, most of these duties are being done today, but he wants this codified in law as to what the duty of this division would be. The second thing it does, it changes the way in which the lottery interacts with the AG's office when it comes to background checks required for licenses. In short, lottery, lottery will do a lot of the data gathering uh, and more closely with the AG's office, but uh, the AG's office will still have the final stay as to the fitness of an applicant that receives a license. The thought behind this is that it will speed up the process if his people do this data gathering. Uh, and this is not taking any a final authority away from the AG's office in this, this regard. And the fourth thing is that uh, it does give the this division, this new division of investigation enforcement of the rulemaking authority. And the last thing, and for new members, uh, I just want to spend a second uh, using this bill, if you hopefully have the bill in front of you. Uh, the first thing, the creation of the division is on page one of the bill lines one to 22. And what it does is it says amend by adding a new section. So this is a whole new section of law. The second, the second portion is on page one, 23, uh, line 23 to 31, and page two, line one to line 18. And it says, it starts with amend the section of statute. This amends a section of statute. And you will see bold italic, that's the new words, for this section, and you'll see crossed out uh, words, and that is eliminating current 
or it's from statute. And then if you go to uh, line 19 to 23 on, on page two, that is the portion that adds new language, new section to the current statute uh, that gives them a uh, rulemaking authority. So it's important for new members to understand, and again, this is nothing new with the bill, it's just me just pointing it out since I was the first up on this. So uh, the again, and the final thing was the effective date, which was January 1 of 2022. Uh, you're gonna come to find Ways and Means members that there's a difference between applicability date and effective date. So the law will be signed to law by, let's say if we pass this probably in June or July by the signature of the governor if it passes through the House and the Senate. Uh, <clears throat> but the law is not effective until January 1st of 2022. That's what that means. So with that, uh, I know, I know uh, 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 Executive Director Charlie McIntyre is hopefully, Mr. Chair, we can hear from him next to explain a little further. And uh, I'll take questions, but I think, uh, okay, Tom. Oh, Mr. Chair. So you'll take questions now? Yeah, although, uh, yeah, I'll take a few. I think Charlie will do a better job explaining okay. what he's Are there any questions? To yes, uh, Representative Schamber. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think it's a, a very important approach you're taking on this because of dealing with money. Uh, we need enforcement to make sure people are following rules. The only question I have, do you have a uh, financial note to go with this yet, Representative Abrami? Again, th there's no, because we're, he's not asking for new positions here. He's asking for this division to be codified in law this, and he wants to create a formally created division. Now you can ask Charlie, I mean, uh, Executive Director McIntyre, uh, that question as well. But Thank you. Uh, my understanding is that it's just creating the structure. He's going to fill it with existing people. Now down the road, he may ask for people, but through the normal budget process, through his budget requests, that would go to finance. But that's my understanding of the situation. Thank you. Any further questions? I don't see any hands raised. So, thank you. The list that is signed up is uh, next would be Charlie McIntyre, who is the director. Charlie. Charlie McIntyre. You gotta, you gotta let, we gotta let him in. I, I just did. It might take a second. Good morning. I'm, I'm actually in. It, took, it takes about three seconds to log me in. Can you folks hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. So, uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. This is Charlie McIntyre, New Hampshire Lottery Director. Uh, and with me in my office is our Chief Compliance Officer, uh, John Conforti, to answer any questions you might have. Um, fundamentally, this is enhancing and codifying the area regarding an investigation and compliance and gambling in the state and doing a couple things as representative Abrami uh, correctly points out one is allowing us to do the investigation and background work for the AG's office so that we can do it and present it to them they still have the authority to say yes or no but certainly it would be a priority for us also we are steeped in gambling so we tend to know areas a little bit better um, than they would, it's so that it would be a faster turnaround for us uh, and we take a burden off of them. Uh, there's no additional requests for staffing. Um, based on the merger with charitable gambling and racing from four years ago, we have increased the amount of staff that do this function. So now there's about 12 that do it uh, regularly versus when I took it, I think there were three. So uh, we're far more steep. Um, staffed up an investigation function. Um, it also enhances penalties for illegal gambling. Um, under current law, we have the authority to investigate illegal gambling and then do nothing with it, uh, which doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. Um, and so uh, there's that function as well. And then there's an enhanced authorization to um, connect with other law enforcement or receive information from them um, as part of the bill. So. That's our request. Uh, like I said, 
Happy to answer any questions from the committee. Any questions from the committee? Uh, Representative Shanberg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. McIntyre. Uh, if the day comes when you need an increase in this division uh, of investigators, uh, will that be automatically done within your office or will you return to one of the committees? Um, actually, that's a good question, Representative. So um, we have a number of open positions that are funded that we haven't filled yet because we didn't see a need. Um, we're not you know, fans of just staff and folks because we have no open positions. We use them judiciously, as you can imagine. So absent an expansion of gambling, we wouldn't need to come back to the legislature for additional positions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Further questions? Yeah, I have a question. Right. Uh, first one, I see your hands up is Representative Amanda. Thank, thank you. Um, uh, Director, this is Representative Amanda Gorg. And I have just a quick question for you. Um, have, what Can you share the conversations that you've had with the Attorney Generals uh, and let us know what their thoughts are on this change? So certainly, um, so our Chief Compliance Officer, John Goodforty, was formerly the AG's office and he had the conversation, so he'll answer for us. Sure, so we, we did have a conversation with the investigators who have been assisting us. Um, and uh, I think they're aware that this change is happening. And from my understanding, there isn't any objection from, um, from the Department of Justice at this point in time. I know that at presently, the investigations that we send over are um, our lower priority for them, obviously, uh, given the other uh, very important work that they do. Um, and so again, as uh, Director McIntyre said, this isn't taking them out of the equation for the decision-making, it's just taking some of the legwork off of their plate. Right, and there's been nobody from the AG's office that signed up on this bill. Uh, Representative Ames. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, this is for Director McIntyre. And um, my question relates to the, uh, the subparagraph four of new 284-3A that uh, sets up a uh, system for uh, petitioning for equity relief with the Superior Court for uh, pen enhanced penalty uh, uh, not to exceed $50,000 per violation. And um, could you uh, sort of fully explain that? You, you referred to this new authority, but I'd like to know the, uh, the, the reasoning and uh, what's new about it uh, as compared with where you are now. Go ahead, John. Sure. Uh, Representative Ames, uh, this is John Conforti again. I'll, I'm going to jump in and, and answer that question. So the thought process behind this is uh, presently there is some finding authority uh, with respect to certain violations but they are um, very, um, the, the, the dollar amounts are very small. Um, and so there was a concern that um, as charitable gaming may uh, get uh, larger, um, that some of the fines would be effective, uh, would be ineffective uh, as a deterrent. Um, so this section um, basically permits us to go over the existing fine structure uh, by going to court um, that will be uh, fleshed out completely within rulemaking in terms of uh, what what would uh, what would constitute an enhanced uh, penalty under the statute. Um, what, what we are what we anticipate would be things like repeated violations um, or or things that strike at the very heart of the integrity of the charitable gaming or the charitable gaming system, um, and that would permit us, uh, of course, with the assistance of the attorney general's office. Uh, to go to court and get uh, very particular relief that isn't available to us within the current statutory framework. Charlie, you might have done this, but uh, could you re-identify the person that just spoke? Oh, certainly. Sorry, it's uh, John Conforti, our Chief Compliance Officer. Thank you. Next question is from uh, Representative John Janigia. Janigia. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
My, my question is uh, more of a general nature. Is there, was there any one event that, that triggered the need for this bill or is it kind of a sense that gambling operations are growing and there needs to be more oversight or, or something else? Yeah, uh, Representative, thank you for the question. It's more the latter. Um, certainly, I, I took over this agency 10 years ago and we were doing $200 million a year in revenue. And this year we'll perhaps, in terms of overall betting, it'll cross a billion dollars. All, all in, sports betting, charitable gambling, kino, internet, traditional lottery. So it's, it's hard to scale up a business. And this is part of that scaling up, is really enhancing our compliance and investigation function, which in any gambling operation is a critical function. It's one of the three major functions you would have. So it's more to your latter point, Representative. Great. Right. Okay. Thank you. You have a follow up, Representative? No, no follow up. I don't see any more hands raised? Okay. Um, turn the turn around. Turn oh, sorry. <laughs> Representative Spillsbury. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so it's my understanding that this doesn't really change the nature of enforcement. It just shifts the responsibility from the Attorney General's office into your office where it's going to get more urgency and more focus. And that seems fine to me. My question is, what is the special fund established in RSA 284-21J uh, into which fines are deposited? Uh, that's our that's our normal that's education fund. So that's the fund all of our revenues are deposited into, um, from which our expenses are paid, and then the residual is left over for the education trust fund transfer, which is monthly around ten million. Thank you. Any further questions? I don't see. Uh, let me just check the list here. Next it would be Rick Newman signed up to testify in support. Rick Newman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Rick Newman. I represent the New Hampshire Charitable Gaming Operators Association. Uh, the Charitable Gaming Operators Association are the uh, Facilities uh, are made up of the facilities that uh, do uh, charity gaming under two RSA 287D, uh, commonly known as poker rooms. So just to distinguish from uh, bingo halls or whatnot. So those are, that's the association I represent. Um, there are about 750 uh, licensees uh, working in that industry. We support over 500 charities annually with contributions in the range of around $12 million a year annually going to charities from these rooms. And we are here uh, to briefly uh, support this legislation. The, the number one um, item uh, of importance in any gambling is integrity. And uh, the, the, it's imperative that the public and regulators and legislators are confident that any gambling, whether it be in Las Vegas, Atlantic City, or Manchester, New Hampshire, that there is integrity in the game, and we are committed uh, to seeing that that happens. I think, just to give you one example of a change that is of substance in this bill, the current law, Director McIntyre mentioned it, I just want to reemphasize re it, is that currently, while, while there are certainly illegal gambling is illegal, <clears throat> there have been times when there's been suspected illegal gambling and then really while you can point it out there's nothing anyone can do about it this bill gives some specific authority to the lottery commission to be able to enforce and penalize those who might engage in illegal gambling um so i i believe that uh, this is a very good change uh it will make enforcement efficient and our members support it wholeheartedly thank you mr chairman Thank you. Any questions? I don't see any hands raised up. And I have the blue sheet. And the blue sheet shows that uh, 
Eric Lachlan, representing himself, is not in support of the bill. And then Thomas Donnie, D-O-A-E-N-Y, member from the public, representing himself, neutral on the bill. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Eric Lachlan is supporting the bill. Thomas Donnie is neutral. No other questions from participants from those attending virtually. I'm closing the public hearing on House Bill 533. Okay, I'm going to open the public hearing on House Bill 568-FN-A, an act increasing exemptions to the interest and dividend tax and repealing the tax in 2025. The prime sponsor is representing Cyber Silver and is representing Silver. Who am I letting in? Yes, Norm Silver. Norm yes. Silver. Okay, let me find him. Oh, someone already did. Okay. You should be good to go. I don't know if you can hear me or see me. We can hear you. More important to hear me than to see me. Uh, I'm Norm Silver, uh, state representative from Belknap County District 2, which is the towns of Guilford and Meredith. Um, I'm the prime sponsor of the bill, and there are numerous co-sponsors in the House and a couple from the Senate. What the bill seeks to do is to, uh, currently, the interest and dividends tax, which we've had for a long time in New Hampshire, is a flat 5% above a threshold. And the threshold has varied. Right now, the threshold is uh, $2,400 for an individual and double that for a married couple. The bill would increase the, th the filing threshold. It would double it next year, triple it in 2023, quadruple it in 2024, and in 2025, the tax would disappear entirely. The um, Right now, there are uh, six states in the country that have no personal income tax and 11 that have a personal income tax with a rate lower than our 5% rate. The revenues from the IND tax uh, to the state based on the latest information from the DRA from their website is that the only uh, element of revenues that is smaller than the IND tax, there's two, the communications tax and the tobacco settlement. Uh, right now, uh, total uh, revenues from the IND tax are less than 2% of the total uh, revenues. So what the problem is here is that this, there, there's two problems. One is on whom does the tax fall? And the second is uh, basically a truth in taxation type of argument. Uh, we have been holding ourselves out in New Hampshire for a very long time as having no personal income tax. 
But the reality is, is that we do have a personal income tax and it's the IND tax. Um, in fact, chapter 77 of the RSA is entitled taxation of incomes. So uh, we, we're really misleading people who might consider moving to New Hampshire that we don't have a personal income tax when in fact we do. Um, there's not a lot of, there is a lot of anecdotal evidence that people might be deterred from moving to New Hampshire because of the IND tax, particularly retirees who have substantial savings and investments. And I have personally been contacted by some people from out of state asking about the IND tax and whether it was ever going to be uh, eliminated or you know, repealed or reduced uh, because they were thinking about New Hampshire versus Florida, aside from weather considerations. So basically, uh, what, who, gets, who gets hit with the tax? Savers, investors, seniors, and retirees who have accumulated investments on which they rely to live. So the people who can probably least afford to pay the tax or who might just up and move to another state without such an onerous tax get hit with a tax. It's a very small portion of our state's revenue. Uh, it uh, contributes to misleading the public. I see ads sometimes on the Wall Street Journal for from real estate brokers advertising properties in New Hampshire. And one of the reasons I say why to move to New Hampshire is we have no personal income tax. Well, we know that's, that's just not true. So what we're trying to do is basically conform our tax policy to what we've been saying it is, which is that we have no personal income tax. Um, do we continue to misrepresent to the rest of the world that we have no personal income tax? And my view is that we should not. Uh, it is a very small portion of our revenues and uh, we should uh, engender trust in our citizens by saying the truth and doing the tax, the tax policy should be truthful. Um, I'm sure there are other arguments uh, that can be made uh, on both sides of this, but there is a lot of support for phasing this out. We can wean ourselves off this tax over a period of four years. Uh, I would, in 2017, I introduced a bill that would have basically wiped out the tax in one swoop, and that did not appeal to anyone. So this way, the way it's designed by increasing the filing threshold gradually over three years and in the fourth year of repeal, we can wean ourselves off because we can see how, uh, the, what the revenue decline is and adjust the budget accordingly. So that's the reason for this. I would like to, uh, to see uh, uh, an OTP from the uh, committee on this, uh, and I'm available to answer any questions. Okay, any questions for the Reverend side? None? This one's here. Okay. Then next we will go to Greg Moore. Greg is a lobbyist in American for Prosperity for New Hampshire. He supported the bill and wants to testify. Greg Moore. I don't see him on the attendees list. Is it Aiden by chance? Are you Greg Moore? Aiden Moore? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, and we will go to. Um, Let me try one more time. Okay. Is, it, is this Greg Moore? Aiden Moore is from the Liquor Commission. Aiden Moore is from the Liquor Commission. Okay. So we'll go to Devin. American for Prosperity. Right. Right. Uh, <laughs> would you like me to move on to Devin Broderick? <clears throat> okay, then uh, we will move on to Devin Broderick. Who's, who's from the DRA? So Devin. Thank you, Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Devin Roderick. I'm a financial analyst with the New Hampshire Department of Revenue, Tax Policy and Legislative Analysis Group. I'm also joined by Melissa Rollins. I was hoping you could also promote her in case she needs to answer any questions as well. And can you hear me okay? Yes. <clears throat> As uh, Representative Silver had explained, the 
um, proposed bill um, increases um, both the filing threshold for the IND tax in basically three increments, as well as increasing the exemptions that are um, provided for the IND tax. Those include the um, exemption for being 65 years of age or older. There's also a blind exemption and a disabled exemption. And those apply to both the um, principal filer and the spouse for those who file joint returns. It increases those exemptions, like I said, over three, uh, three taxable years, and then eventually repeals the IND tax applicable to taxable periods beginning after December 31st, 2024. There is no way for the Department of Revenue to determine the exact fiscal impact of increasing exemptions under the IND tax and repealing it altogether. Hence in our fiscal note, it was an indeterminable decrease in general fund revenues, which is where the IND tax is deposited. Um, the department has no definitive method also to determine any future IND tax liability or credit carry forward amounts. However, using available data from tax year 2019, we are able to estimate the fiscal impact um, from the proposed bill um, as follows. Um, we, we looked at <clears throat> um, tax year 2019 liabilities being reported by taxpayers um, as being 113.8 million. Um, exemptions actually claimed in 2019 were used to estimate the proposed increases per year. We also did an analysis based on prior years breakout to apply that tax year revenue to a fiscal year basis. Um, in the fiscal note and also in the um, fiscal note quick guide, we attached a chart which shows the estimated revenue on a year over year basis as well as, as, well as the cumulative fiscal impact, eventually reaching the 113.8 million as mentioned a minute ago as being the tax year 19 total liability. Just please note that the, <clears throat> our fiscal estimated fiscal impact does not take into account any overpayments or credit carry forwards on file. The use of these overpayments could further increase the loss in revenue as taxpayers stop making payments and supplement the payments with overpayments they have on file before the tax is repealed. We also have no way of determining how the taxpayer would utilize the overpayment, whether they would use it or multiple years or they would claim it as a refund once the tax is repealed. Similarly, similarly, there could be trailing amounts of IND tax collected even once the, uh, the tax is fully repealed from audit and collection activity. Please note that there were a couple, there are a couple outstanding items that we identified as technical defects with the bill. Um, section 13 of the proposed bill would interfere with DRA collection and audit activity, which may occur after the proposed repeal based on the way it's written. Uh, it interferes with the statute of limitations as outlined in RSA 21J29. We would recommend a repeal that accommodates the collection audit activity within the statute of limitations. And lastly, section two of the proposed bill, which addresses the increases in exemptions, uses the terminology tax year, um, ending December 31st of each change. The department would recommend stating taxable periods ending on or after December 31st instead of the word tax year for purposes of fairly administering the tax. I am available for any questions if you have any. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Devin. Yes. Representative Schamberg here. Questions. If I may, Mr. Chair, do you have the total number of uh, taxpayers in this uh, IND? And secondly, uh, is there a statistical breakdown of individuals versus partnerships, limited liability companies and associations that pay into the IND? Just numbers? Uh, so I can answer the first part now. Um, for, for tax year 2019 data, there were a total of 70,437 IND returns filed for 2019. Um, 37,340 of those returns claimed exemptions. As far as the breakdown by entity, if you hold on one moment, please. So in our, I would like to point out one resource, our, the DRA annual report available on our websites. Um, 
under tax year 2018, individual and joint filers represented 97.3% of the overall population and represented conversely about 98.4% of the liability. Estates and partnerships represented about um, about two and a half percent of the population and about 2% of the liability. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Welcome. Welcome. Further questions? Sam, we're gonna go back and see if uh, Greg Moore is, is here. He is here now, the hand is great. Representative, uh, um, Representative Malloy had his hand up. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, I'm sorry. Representative Malloy, you have a question? Yes, sir. Thank you for uh, taking, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for um, recognizing me. And uh, thank you, Representative uh, Silver, for uh, taking my question. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> Devin. Uh, uh, Maybe this is a naive question, but is it possible? Is it reasonable or possible, or should we even try to separate out what is an individual tax as opposed to the IND taxes on on businesses and corporations? That's just a, a question, and I don't know that there's an answer to that. And I uh, uh, that's uh, that's my question. As far as uh, breaking out what this bill does to certain entities, is that what your question is? Uh, let me be, um, let me clarify. Would it be a, in your opinion, a, a different bill or a, uh, to, it would be a different bill, would it be a better bill <clears throat> to, or not, to have a bill for uh, doing this for individuals and have a bill for doing this for uh, uh, businesses, two separate, uh, instead of rolling this into one. That's something that I would have to consult with our with some other folks in our department as far as the um, constitutionality of that goes, and as, as well as the feasibility of that. I'd have to get back to the committee on that, but I, I definitely will. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. No problem. I don't see any more hands raised. So uh, we've got a great Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, and thank you for working uh, with me through my technical difficulties um, in this new world we're living in. Uh, for the record, my name is Greg Moore. I am the state director with Americans for Prosperity here in New Hampshire. And I'm here today to offer Americans for Prosperity New Hampshire's full support for the goal of phasing out the interest and dividends tax. As I'm sure everyone knows, um, many in New Hampshire are fond of saying that we don't have an income tax. And, and while it's true that the state doesn't generally tax wages, uh, of course, as this committee knows, Grand Estate is our tax on interest and dividends income. Moreover, in recent years, DRA has indicated that the majority of IND tax filers are seniors, many of, them, <coughs> many of whom are taxed on their retirement instruments like annuities. Unfortunately, uh, this has had the effect of motivating many of these seniors to become residents of states that don't tax this income like Florida. I personally know a number of seniors who have left New Hampshire as a direct result of this tax. And when they declare residency in another state, it follows a predictable pattern that the mid net worth retirees leave entirely while a high net worth individual simply spend more than half their year in another state and keep their homes here while, while they come from late spring to early fall. And the economic impact of losing these individuals is, is substantial. Not only do they, do they not spend their money here to grow our economy, they're also not investing here which undermines future successful businesses from taking root. It certainly uh, wasn't lost on me when during the worst of the pandemic for those states, New York Governor uh, Andrew Cuomo and New Jersey Governor Murphy used their uh, COVID press conferences to beg high net worth individuals not to abandon those states because they said the economic impact would be, in their words, devastating. And yet here in New Hampshire, we have a, ve a vehicle that takes these folks right out of our state. And I'd like to offer the committee a concrete example to drive home the point. As a former member of the House, uh, or a former member of the House, and uh, in fact, uh, someone who served with the chair and the vice chair in the Rockingham County delegation, the Honorable Will Smith, who made abundantly clear that he changed his residency from New Hampshire to Florida exclusively to avoid paying this tax. Now, Will still, still spends time here at his home in Newcastle for about five months a year, 
but that's down from the nine months he would used to spend here before uh, before he moved as a result of the, of the IND tax. While the, the loss of additional uh, the loss of the addition to the economy he would have added over the, those additional four months is real. There's a bigger issue. When Will was a full-time New Hampshire resident, he was involved in angel investing here. However, now that he's a Florida resident, he no longer is involved in that area. So losing four months from Will has a magnified economic impact on our state. And that's just one example. I have several other individuals I know who have stories just like Will's. I also have stories that over our middle, middle class uh, individuals who are activists of ours, who simply packed up and left for good as a result of this tax. And what's most personally impactful is when they ask for contact information from an AFP chapter in states like Florida, Texas, or Arizona, where they're moving so that they can still stay involved, but they wish that they could have stayed here. I've even, even had one of our activists move to Alaska over this tax, which is hardly where I suppose I'd want to spend my uh, retirement. The point here is that losing these folks is not good for our economy, period. The good news is that we have an example of a state that phased out its IND tax to understand its impact. Tennessee, as of this past New Year's Day, did away with its hall income tax, which was its own IND tax. And like us, Tennessee also doesn't tax wages. The Beacon Center of Tennessee, a policy think tank, has been tracking the effect of the phase out of the hall income tax over time. Their research has shown that the estimated anticipated overall revenue losses from phasing out this tax have not materialized and the state stands in a stronger position economically as a result. So while a static analysis of the reduction in revenue will seem significant, it's also important to balance that against the potential economic growth, which can also be benefit state revenues. That's why we fully support the, the idea of the phase out of an IND tax. Not only would it make New Hampshire a truly income tax free, but it would add new unexpected economic growth to our state. Now, while we fully support the phase out of the IND tax, we would do it differently than the manner in, included in House Bill 568. Instead of increasing exemptions, we would suggest a manner similar to House Bill 529, which came to this committee in 2017, sponsored by Representative Ken Weiler. That bill gradually reduced the INT tax rate, <clears throat> which we believe is a better phase out strategy and one that matches how Tennessee phased out its hall income tax. The reason why we prefer that route is because in our view, the best tax reform strategy is to, is to keep the base as broad as possible and to, and to reduce rates while the uh, House Bill 568 shrinks the base and keeps the rates at, at, at a higher level. Moreover, we are concerned about that if in 2025, <clears throat> the state legislature were to choose to stop the phase out, then the reduction in the base of the tax as a result of the increase in the exemption could leave the state vulnerable to litigation. The state no longer has a broadly based IND tax and puts us in a constitutional jeopardy similar to the BPT litigation from the late eighties and early nineties. <clears throat> it is for that reason we support the phase out similar to House Bill 529 from two, two legislatures ago. Thank you for the opportunity to testify here today and I'd be happy to answer any questions and, and I have a cold it, it is not the coronavirus so thank you thank you uh, members of the committee thank you Greg questions Greg Moore no hands raised no questions here so then we will go to Dan McGuire representing the member of the public and also the Granite State Taxpayers <coughs> Association, who's in support of the bill, Dan McGuire. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. May I be permitted to testify via video? I did put my tie on this morning. <laughs> Mr. Chair, would you like me to Yes. You should be. There I am. <laughs> uh, I Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Dan McGuire, and today I'm representing Granite State Taxpayers. I've been a member of the board for over 10 years. Um, we're in su support of this bill, um, reduce the interest and dividends tax. Oh. Hold on a second. <laughs> Oh, 
my cell phone is muted, but my phone is on. Um, so we're in support of this bill to eliminate the interest and dividends tax, um, because in our opinion, and in my opinion, this is the worst tax that we have, the most destructive to our economy um, of all the ones, you know, the BPT, the other taxes and so on. In general, a tax uh, discourages whatever it is that's being taxed, the activity or the item or, or what have you. And, and sometimes that's explicit because things like these uh, tax on tobacco we explicit and other sin taxes, we explicitly want less of what a, less tobacco use, uh, less uh, liquor use, et cetera, because they're, they're um, destructive to the public health. And so it's, it's very effective. The high tax on cigarettes um, causes fewer people to smoke, people to smoke less, et cetera, which, which but this tax, the interest and dividends tax, is a tax on savings. And savings is the most um, important thing for the economy to move forward because savings creates capital. It creates businesses, it creates machines, it creates innovation. And that is how the economy gets better year after year. And, and it's an improving econ economy, which helps the citizens of New Hampshire, which, which um, improves their lives, um, makes one year better than the next and so on. Why was 2020 such a horrible year, right? 2019 was a very fine year. 2020 was horrible because it wasn't as good as 2019. And so for, for general, um, well-being and happiness, we need an improving economy. What definition um, today is better than yesterday. And so um, it's the interest and dividends tax or it's savings really, which create a better tomorrow than today. And so um, it's, it's, it needs to be eliminated. Um, if, if there's any tax you cut, this is the one that should be cut. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Mr. McGuire. Uh, Honorable McGuire, any questions from the participants? And I do not see any hands raised. So then we will go to Melissa Rawls from the DRA staff with mutual experience. Hi, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Um, I am all set. I was just here to support Devin Roderick if needed. So I think he has covered everything that needs to be said from the DRA. Thank you. Anybody else wishes to testify? I cannot see it, so we do have a number that have signed up. And I will read the list. Senator Daniels has signed up in support. Senator Cardi in support. I'm sorry, Nicole uh, Forgey from the public who's lined up opposed. Representative John Kotek in support. Representative Yokoa in support. Representative Lucas in support. Representative Mooney in support. Representative Green in support. Bob Green. Representative Harley in support. Representative Doug Thomas in support. Eric Rathborn, member of the public, opposing. Representative. And then uh, Alvin C., member of the public, in support. 
No, the first one. Yes, th uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just have to say I'm having a very hard time uh, understanding you. Uh, uh, and I don't know if it's my side or uh, it's a microphone issue or when uh, it seems to be kind of cutting in and out, uh, faint. Uh, so I could not hear clearly uh, all the names of the people that uh, 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 signed in. So I, I, I would, I think we have a technical issue and I would uh, urge the uh, staff to help us correct that so we can all hear clearly uh, your comments. Thank you. Okay, and then for the members of the committee, uh, I do have a list and I'll make sure everybody gets a copy. Uh, Representative Major, I have a question. Yeah, I'm sorry. I should have brought this up earlier, but uh, when Representative, uh, when Mr. Moore from AFP was testifying, it seemed that he was reading a statement. Will that statement be uh, sent to us? I do not have a copy, but we will have to ask Greg Moore about sending the statement to us. We'll check on that. Okay, thank you. Representative Elliott, you have a question? You need to unmute, unmute yourself. You're talking about me, Jenny? Yes. No. Okay. Yes, Bob. Uh, Norm, are you speaking with your mask on? Is that why you sound so muffled? No. no I, I've taken the mask off. Is that still muffled? Maybe you can lift the microphone up just a little bit so it's pointing more towards your, more towards your mouth. Okay, is this better? Yes. Okay. Much. Hey, I have all kinds of helpers here to help me. <laughs> all right, then, uh, Representative Tucker. Unmute. Uh, uh, Hint, you can just press the button. Tucker, you can unmute. unmute. Uh, I just wanted to say that I had arrived late, but I'm here. Okay, noted, thank you. Okay. And the same for me. Welcome. And Representative Urley. Yeah, I uh, remember yesterday I mentioned uh, that they had some problems uh, in the committee rooms with uh, in, in commerce across the hall. Well, or upstairs across the hall. Um, that's the same kind of issue they're having here that the uh, table mics don't seem to be picking up uh, as um, efficiently as they could. And also a little hack. You don't have to do it yourself. All you have to do. Should we do a test for the table mics to see if they can hear us? That's yeah, all you have to do is press the space bar and it'll unmute you temporarily. Let's try something different. They just moved the table mic up closer. Yeah, I moved it closer. Do I need to take it away? No, let's check. I, I think the, that's better. The table mic up closer, how, how is that? Much better. Representative Major, there is an attendee that's on a telephone with their hand up. Shall I give them permission to talk? Yes. And who is that? Uh, that's what we're trying to figure out. <laughs> I believe it is uh, Chris Christensen, um, but the caller needs to press star six to unmute themselves. We will get these bugs worked out eventually.
Your name is the person on the telephone. They've just unmuted, and I believe it may be Chris Christensen, but we'll need that to be um, verified. Yes, this is Chris Christensen. Yes, Chris. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think you have my letter. Oh, I'm Chris Christensen representing myself. Uh, I'm from Merrimack, New Hampshire. The gist of my testimony is in the letter that you've already received. I'll try not to repeat that. Uh, I agree wholeheartedly with Representative Silber's comments uh, about this. I would like to add one set of circumstances that I uh, think is pretty ironic, actually. And that is that this interest in dividends tax started many years ago with an exemption for New Hampshire savings institutions and Vermont. Uh, and the intent was to bring more money into the banking system in New Hampshire. And I think for a time it was successful. In the 80s, banks started doing national mergers and that exemption was seen as a restraint of trade and instead of eliminating the tax completely, it was extended to all interest in dividends. Seemed like a good idea at the time, I guess. But now we've heard testimony, and I, I have personal experience with friends in, in the state, uh, that it is chasing people out of the state. They're leaving and going to Florida or wherever it might be uh, to avoid this particular tax. And sometimes to avoid some cold weather, I guess. In the meantime, I think we've done a good job bringing some money into the state with such things as uh, tax exemptions for New Hampshire trusts. And I think if we're going to be a, a complete picture, that eliminating the interest and dividends tax would continue in that direction and attract more money into the state rather than chasing it out. Uh, other than that, I, I think everything else has been said by others, and I'm willing to accept any questions. I hope you'll vote ought to pass. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, any questions? I do not see any raised hands from either participants here. So I'm going to close the public hearing on House Bill 568 10 Okay, I'm going to open the public hearing on House Bill 210-FN, an act increasing the exemption under the interest and dividend tax and decreasing the total amount of research and development credit against the business taxes. Prime sponsor is Representative Lang. Representative Lang, you can introduce your bill. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I'm not sure if they can hear me with the mic moves, but you can take the mic over to that desk over there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you. I'm glad to be back in front of Ways and Means. I just said earlier, it's my second most favorite committee because now that I'm chair of Fish and Game, I think that has to be my primary committee. But um, thank you for having me back. I appreciate uh, being able to speak on this, this important bill. Um, this bill does two basic things. It allows New Hampshire citizens to keep their money, and it requires New Hampshire businesses not to have a tax subsidy that we're giving them right now for a tax credit. Um, the second part of this bill basically creates liability on the first part of, it, of this bill. In other words, if we're giving a businesses an increased tax credit, then someone has to pay for that in the budget. 
and that comes from people who pay taxes like people who pay the interest and dividends tax. What I tried to do here, because having served two terms on this committee, one of the things I used to dislike when someone came in with a, uh, a reduction bill is they didn't explain how they're going to pay for the hole in the budget that they were creating. This bill seeks to do that. It nets out the difference. So the, as you see from the fiscal note, um, part one of this bill that increases the exemptions for people who are subject to the interest and dividends tax has a rough cost of about $5 million. Um, the second half of this bill, which reduces the, the uh, research and development tax credit, reduces that by $5 million, getting out of zero difference roughly for the state in our income. So we're not creating a budget deficit or a budget hole uh, in this bill of any significance. Um, one thing I will, I will say, again, having served in this committee, we've had BDA and, and DRA both in on this, on this bill speaking. Um, every time we've asked for the direct correlation of a tax credit to um, a state benefit, on this particular one, usually what we hear is it's a checkbox. That when businesses are coming into the state, one of the questions they always ask is, does the state have a research development tax credit? Yes or no. It's a checkbox on a form. Not how much it is, but merely do you have one. This bill still keeps that checkbox checked. It reduces it from the interest, uh, the research development tax credit from $7 million back to $2 million. This was its, originally when the research development tax credit was implemented by staff, by law, by a bill, it was implemented at $2 million. Through a budget negotiation, into the, one of the House Bill 2s, all of a sudden $5 million appeared on the research and development tax credit and it now is increased to $7 million. This is not to me a proper way of doing budgeting and billing and, and should come back to the House if someone wants to bring it back up to $7 million. Let's do it through a bill, let's do it through the proper way with proper testimony and not through a budget deal that was made in House Bill 2. So I think this bill also seeks to fix an injustice. That was done and, and granted a, a business subsidy and a tax credit um, without proper procedure. Um, I'm happy to take questions. I know you're going to have BEA and probably DRA and probably BIA and half a dozen other acronyms speaking, um, and they may have better answers than I do. But I'm happy to speak to the bill again. I think you'll see this bill is is a good bill. It lets New Hampshire tax uh, New Hampshire citizens keep five million dollars of their money. And it allows businesses who are subject to tax to pay the tax to actually cut. Thank you, Representative Lang. Take a question. Yes, I will, sir. Mr. Chair. Is the BIA going to speak today or not? They yes. are. Then I'll hold my question until then. Thank you. Representative Van Jigen. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Thank you, Representative Lang, for taking my question. Um, what you're proposing on the face of it seems to make sense. I guess my question would be based on the testimony we heard on the previous bill, eliminating the interest and dividends tax. Um, many of those arguments were that we're losing a lot of um, high income investors or high, you know, people who are, who are benefiting from, they're moving to Florida to avoid the tax. So if, if you go from a 2,400 exemption to a $3,500 exemption, is that really going to stop um, you know, what we heard previously where a lot of these uh, people are, are moving to Florida and other states? So again, this, the idea behind this bill is that it's really dealing with the smaller investors. right? We're increasing that exemption and the threshold before you have to pay this tax. And so the smaller investors would become now no longer subject to the tax to be able to keep their money. The larger investors are still subject to the tax if they exceed the threshold. Thank you. I don't see any other hands up. So thank you. The next testify would be the jury, the MERS, the member of the public, and opposing the bill. Would you like her in, Jen? I do not see. I do not see. Oh, Julie Demers, but it looks like the New Hampshire Tech Alliance, which is Miss um, Demers's um, 
organization has raised their hand. Um, and I've just allowed them to talk. Please um, unmute yourself. Hi, thank you so much. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. And thank you all for your time today. Um, so as it was noted, my name is Julie Dem Demers and I'm here on behalf of the New Hampshire Tech Alliance. Um, the Tech Alliance is the largest member-driven technology association in the state. We support research, innovation, economic and workforce development efforts that have helped New Hampshire become a national leader in technology-based indus industrial and development and entrepreneurism. Um, our organization works to promote and grow our tech sector by reducing barriers to growth and finding better ways to access capital and the human resources needed to support the New Hampshire economy in years like this and beyond. So our government affairs efforts, which is a comprehensive team representative of our membership, focus on ensuring that the regulatory structure is as business friendly as possible and that growth incentives are in place to serve our members. Therefore, today we're standing in opposition to this bill. We recognize that a healthy R&D tax credit is a critical component of a larger effort to um, better the business climate for New Hampshire high tech companies. And it is a key component in attracting high tech businesses. I would argue that it's not just a box to check. Um, a, cr a cut to the existing credit will impede our ability to continue to grow the tech sector in New Hampshire. So tech stands alongside advanced manufacturing as one of the leading drivers of our economy. So the technology sector alone contributed 10.9 billion or 13.7% of the state's GDP um, in 2019. And jobs in this sector pay higher wages and export products from the state to other areas and nations um, in the world. So this is effectively transferring outside money into the state's economy. Um, these sectors provide healthy living wages to New Hampshire individuals and their families. So you're looking at technology companies whose median tech occupation wages um, continue to increase and they're 85% higher than New Hampshire's median state wages. So that's continuing to grow. That's up from 80% in 2018. So I understand the argument that we want New Hampshire citizens to keep their money, but this is at the expense of the com companies that are bringing these really high paying jobs with healthy wages. Um, and although New Hampshire arguably does have a very high quality of life, it also has one of the highest tax um, business tax rates in the nation. Our current R&D tax credit program supports the growth in the tech sector. It allows us to remain competitive in the global marketplace. With, um, especially in this environment with remote workforces being increasingly more accepted, we're fielding calls every week of technology companies that are looking to move here and they have an interest in New Hampshire. I'm just asking that we do not give these companies a reason to look to other states that have more attractive R&D tax credits, lower energy costs, more fav favorable environmental and labor regulations, and, and lower business taxes. I'm going to reiterate again that it was mentioned that this is just a box to check. It's really not. These companies are comparing apples to apples, and it could be the make or break between a company coming here, bringing high paying jobs, um, or going elsewhere. Um, so in 2018, I, I think there was an interest in understanding the impact of this. And I, I'm sure you have this information, but in 2018, the first year that that tax credit was available, you had 71 companies reporting more than 112 million of qualified research and development related wages that had engaged and applied for that credit. In 2020, that, that increased to 230 companies. So the companies are taking advantage of this. So our membership specifically, which ranges from small startups to large companies that conduct commerce both nationally and globally, um, benefits from a healthy R&D tax credit program. Um, so ultimately, we feel that a change to the existing um, R&D tax credit would be a huge step backwards for our membership, the, uh, the sector and the state overall, and when you're looking at the companies that are looking to grow here and what we want New Hampshire to be about four or five years down the road. So thank you. I, I appreciate the time today and I'd be open to any questions. Okay, we have a question from Alan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Mers, 
Uh, I was the uh, chair at the time that we set up the R&D uh, tax credit. It is from 2009, I believe, maybe eight, eight. Um, and at that time, it was meant as a million to check a box on uh, and it got raised to two million and then all of a sudden to seven million because uh, so many more companies wanted to use it. But everybody that uh, uses this credit first has to take the federal credit. And we have never been given information that would allow us to understand what percentage of the federal tax credit is what they are getting from the state one since the state really can't afford very much money for things like this. And it goes on your local property tax if we cut our taxes at the state level too much. Thank you. Thank you. Do you, for have, that, you have information on this on when someone gets the federal tax credit and then they turn around and get the New Hampshire tax credit, what, what is the ratio? in terms of money acquired? I do not have that information, but I just made a note um, to have that be a talking point and have our government affairs committee and also our executive committee look into seeing if this can be information that we could actively gather um, for future reference. Thank you. Thanks. Representative Noonan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Mr. Myers, for testifying with us today. Uh, in your testimony, you, uh, you alluded to uh, statistics, statistics from other states uh, on this R&D. Do you have any information on those other states that you were talking about so that we can have a comparison to their, their rates as a comparison to ours? I have it anecdotally, but if that would be helpful for you to see, I think that could be something we could pull together. Thank you. Any further questions? Seeing none, we will go to Dan McGuire, who supports Dan, have to let him. Okay, this is good. Okay, Dan McGuire. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Dan McGuire. I'm from Epsom and I'm a member of the Board of Granite State Taxpayers. Um, I'm I, I previously on the, on the previous bill uh, testified why we think the um, interest and dividends tax should be reduced if and elimin ideally eliminated. Um, but I also am in favor, or we are also in favor of the other half of this bill, which is reducing or eliminating the research and development tax credit. Now, I personally am an angel investor and frequently invest in tech startups. And so you might think that I'd all in favor of the research and development tax credit, but I've heard in any meeting where we consider um, investing in a, in a tech company, that, that this is any kind of issue um, or that uh, any kind of a benefit or anything like that. Um, if uh, it, it, Representative Almi is, is exactly correct, and let me expand her point. If you go into this bill and look at the RSA that has the research and development tax credit, it refers to a section of the US tax code and if you go search for that and, and read who is actually getting the credit, the definition of this credit, because we just give uh, some fraction of the federal credit to, to New Hampshire companies. So we, we are adding on to the federal credit. You will find that this is not a simple, you know, you did so much research last year, so we're gonna give you a fraction of it back. Um, this is not based on just last year's activity Activity. definition of, of the research uh, credit in, um, in federal tax law is based on, uh, it's a very complicated formula, but it has to do with, you know, what did you do since 1981? How much research have you done in the past, et cetera? So, so in my opinion, 
what's what it really does is benefit companies that were small um, at in you know 20 30 years ago such as Microsoft Apple Intel etc they're the ones getting the bulk of this of this credit um, it's not about how much research did you do last year? And therefore, if you're increasing it, you're going to get a better, you know, pay less tax this year. So, so my point is, it, it's not good to distort the tax code in this way and, and say that somehow a high tech company is better than some other kind of company. But also, it It's to have a tax code that's that's favoring specific large companies um, as opposed to to other companies in the same business. So um, we are in in very much in favor of, as I said, reducing or eliminating uh, this particular tax credit. It is not a it's not what you think it is just based on the name of it. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Questions. <clears throat> Mr. McGuire. Uh, Rep. Uh, this is more of a question for the chair. Uh, because of um, the Honorable uh, Mr. McGuire, uh, his testimony kind of cut out a little bit. Is there going to be a written testimony submitted from him? I'd be happy to do that. Um, Thank you, Mr. Barr. We uh, You just cut out just a little bit, and I think that there may have been some important pieces that we might have missed. Uh, no problem. My, my home internet is <laughs> not the best. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do not see anybody else raise hands. So then we will go to the representative. I do see one representative oh. with his hand up. This is John, Representative Janikian. Um, I have a question for Mr. McGuire. Um, I guess in considering your, I, I'm someone who spent 25 years in high tech, uh, not necessarily as an investor, more as a participant, but as you're looking at companies, it seems to me counterintuitive that, I mean, I can see where there's certain companies of certain sizes that, uh, you know, if you're a one or two person startup, the 7 million exemption isn't gonna help you that much. But if you are large enough that, you know, I, I don't know what that number would be, 10, 15 employees, 20 employees, um, 30 employees, where that 7 million makes a huge difference in your R&D budget. Um, I guess my concern would be, are we losing chances for innovation? Because while you're saying large companies, um, you know, it's just a benefit for them, these mid-size, small to mid-size companies, are we possibly losing opportunities for future innovation, which could lead to economic growth? Thank you. Thank you for the question, Representative. I think you'll find that, well, 7 million sounds like a significant number. Um, this is being spread over, I don't know, 50 to 100 companies. You could ask the DRA specifically how many companies um, take advantage of this. But now you're talking about if it were 100 companies, that's $70,000 per company. And $70,000 um, for a company like Microsoft is a nothing, right? So um, I don't think it is a significant uh, factor in where they where they want to be and and uh, where they want to do business and and so on. Uh, it's much more is the ability of the employees. That's a huge part of you know high tech industry as to um, where where you locate. Um, and you know we're somewhat of a subsidiary of the Boston area, so which is a, a hotbed of high tech. And so that's part of it. Follow up, Mr. Chairman. Um, Follow up. So, um, so if we look at the Boston area, do you know what the, uh, in Massachusetts, what they're offering for, any, for an exemption on r and I do not. 
Okay, thank you. Okay, you want to see your hand? Oh, there is one that can be GT wrong. Did I allow him to speak? I, I was just asking Jen about this. Do we, do we need to find out who it is? G-T-H-A-L with a hand up. Representative Major, if you want to continue with your um, preferred list or, or order of calling on speakers, you could call on others at the end. Okay, okay. thank you, Jen. I'm only responding to hands up to questions at this point in time. The next speaker is Dave Gervais, representing the Business and Industry Association. And he's opposing the bill. David. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the House Ways and Means Committee. I trust everyone can hear me okay? Yes. For the record, my name is Dave Juve. I'm a Senior Vice President for Public Policy at the Business and Industry Association. We are a New Hampshire-based statewide chamber of commerce with approximately 400 members, businesses of all sizes from the state's largest companies down to single sole owner operators. I appreciate the opportunity to testify in opposition to House Bill 210 and uh, the opportunity to explain why this would be a um, really unfortunate move for, for the state of New Hampshire to take. I first want to comment on a couple of things from previous testifiers to, I hope, um, clear up what may be some misunderstandings. The first was uh, representative said that the uh, $7 million, which the state is investing in research and development tax credits was uh, in inappropriate uh, budget process or an inappropriate legislative process. And I think what he meant by that was there was not a bill that originated in the house increasing the state investment to 7 million. It was added to the state budget negotiations in the Senate, but that bill as all budget bills do come back to the house for concurrence or non-concurrence. In this case, the house non-concurred, which they almost always do and requested a committee of conference. And at that point, that was the opportunity for the House to question this uh, increase in, in the state investment, or uh, if, if they felt it was that critical to non-concur on the budget, but, but it didn't even come up in the discussion. So I wanna make sure committee members understand that the increase in 7 million wasn't the result of a specific bill, but there was nothing improper about the budgeting process that was undertaken. I'd also like to comment on the check box. Um, and the representative is correct. If we have a um, research and development tax credit, even at a de minimis amount, there will be a box that will be checked. But I can assure you that uh, the program itself and that box will become a laughing stock because if you reduce the state investment to 2 million based on the number of companies that applied in uh, fiscal year 2020, they'll be getting a less than 10 cents on the dollar for what they are eligible for under the research and development tax credit program. I'd also like to address a couple of other things. Um, and I worked with, with Representative Almy back in 2007, the 2007 session where this bill passed, it was, it was implemented in 2008. That was the first year that companies could take advantage of it. And we worked closely together on it. And one of the things we worked on that hasn't been brought up was the original um, language for the bill was the tax credit only applied to business profits taxpayers. But we realized early on that our intent uh, was that this also be available for, for smaller companies that, that may not be profitable and are therefore, therefore only paying the business enterprise tax. And that was added to the bill and that exists in the law to this day. We also did some other things to make sure that smaller companies could take advantage of it. And that is we capped the total amount of credit that would be given out in any uh, given tax year to a maximum of $50,000 per company. And in fact, the uh, 
information from the Department of Revenue Administration on the tax uh, research and development tax credit summary, which I did uh, submit to the committee via email this morning. So I'm hoping all committee members will have a chance to review it. Um, over 230 New Hampshire companies applied for the credit for fiscal year or for uh, tax year 2020. So it's more than double uh, the hundred dollars that a previous or the hundred companies that a previous testifier um, said. It's 230 companies. And by the way, that is increased from the first year of the program from 71 companies. So clearly something is going on. Either there are more companies doing research and development, which uh, this tax credit is meant to um, encourage, or somehow over the years, more companies have heard about it, which if, if uh, they have uh, good accountants, they should have heard about it in 2008. But in any event, of, of those 230 companies, uh, 94 of the companies received, requested less than the $50,000. And that's a good indicator that smaller companies are also taking advantage of this research and development tax credit. And by the way, one of those smaller companies is uh, GraphicCast, which is in Jaffrey. I also included in the email this morning, a recent uh, op-ed piece by Val Zanchuk, who's the president of GraphicCast. He is someone who uh, takes advantage of the research and development tax credit and his op-ed says why. Graphicast has 23 employees. So they are not by any stretch of the imagination, a uh, large high tech or large uh, manufacturing company, but it is critical for them. Um, just a couple of other things. Um, why does the state do this? Well, one reason is that uh, 33 other states around the country uh, have research and development tax credits. So this is not exactly an unusual thing, and, but it is something that New Hampshire needs to be aware of in terms of recruiting companies uh, to the state and wanting companies who are already here to expand their operations. Um, but there's more than that. Uh, it is in a compelling state interest to uh, encourage and foster manufacturing and high technology jobs. I um, have a document here from our state uh, Department of Employment Security. Every year they track average wages. And for the entire state, uh, the average weekly wage for private sector jobs is 1,145. That's for uh, 2019, which is the most recent year they have data for. $1,145 per week um, for private sector employment in New Hampshire. In manufacturing, they break it out by economic sectors. In manufacturing, the average weekly wage is $1,403, um, roughly $250 more, uh, roughly. And if you look at chemical manufacturing, they're $1,600 a week. And if you look at uh, computer and electronic product manufacturing, they're $1,900 a week. So not only are these types of companies providing high wage jobs, which benefits the economy because those wages get plowed back into the economy, um, but they also benefit the state because as you all know, the business enterprise tax is, is, is um, uh, almost entirely based on company compensation. So if a company is, is paying out more in compensation, their business enterprise tax payments will be higher to the state. So there is a compelling interest. Why I'm not suggesting one company is better than the other, one economic sector is better than the other, uh, one job is better than the other, but there are differences. And uh, it's clear that uh, it is in the state's best interest to maintain a healthy manufacturing and high tech economy. And then finally, I wanna address uh, the the issue of this $5 million. Now, I guess I should state that uh, BIA does not have a position on increasing exemptions for the interest in dividends tax or eliminating it entirely. We leave that up to the wisdom of the legislature. I would suggest you don't need to rob from one of the state's most successful economic development programs to fund that. Uh, in using the Department of um, Administrative Services, 
um, most recent revenue focus, which is for December of 2020 or uh, FY 2021, but December of 2020, uh, they say that the state in terms of business profits tax and business enterprise tax is running in excess of $65 million. That's $65 million higher than what budgeted projections were for. So let's not pretend we can't find $5 million somewhere if the state uh, wants to, to increase exemptions or, or, or eliminate the IND tax uh, uh, in its entirety. You don't need to cripple uh, a successful economic development program, one of the few that the state of New Hampshire offers in order to do that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would be happy to address any questions. Questions, uh, Representative Chamber. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Juve. Uh, a question, uh, does the BIA have a statistical number of the new products or improvements to products or jobs or salary increases that are directly related to the last 12 years of research and development tax credits? Uh, the answer to that question is no. And part of the reason why is the BIA nor anyone else outside of the Department of Revenue Administration knows who the companies are. I know a few within the BIA membership because they've expressed some concern about uh, uh, the research and development tax credit being uh, rolled back uh, as this bill would, would uh, purport to do. In fact, the committee heard from two, two members, uh, Val Zanchuk and Tom White from New England Wire, who spoke about the research and development tax credit when you had your economic briefing several weeks ago. Uh, but, but specifically your question, we don't have any way to track that um, because we don't know who, who all the companies are. I can tell you that uh, in terms of employment, since the uh, tax was implemented in 2008, uh, New Hampshire qualified raises, uh, New Hampshire qualified wages, those that qualified for the research and development tax credit rose from 112 million per year to over 510 million now, over a half a billion dollars. That's a pretty significant increase over a 12 year period of time. And I would suggest that it has increased every year and those first years, 2008, 2009, and into 2010, you will remember was um, the, uh, gr the Great Recession. So even in the Great Recession, there was increased uh, usage of R&D tax credits. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dave, on um, we, we have been on some something like a reverse waterfall on this this uh, tax credit. It was started at one million in order to to um, be able to t check that box, and there were not that many people using it at the beginning because we were targeting on. Um, New companies, we were targeting young companies. The only way we could do it was to keep the amount of money available low per capita. We, we did cap it, as you said, and but we had to use the federal tax credit because administratively the state couldn't have handled anything else. Um, but when it was doubled to 2 million because too many people were starting to use it and they were only getting 25,000 each, uh, because it's prorated, um, they, um, the number grew again to take care of the $2 million. And we were back down to 20, 25 each. I think it was 17 each the last year. Um, and they put $5 million more in it. And it's been growing since then. It's under 50000 on. Someday, if we keep this up, and you, BIA is the one that, that started, th that has been asking for this, on um, we're going to have a tax credit that's worth $50 million or something like that. So how do we avoid that without um, going against the, the principle of the Constitution that 
um, we have to treat everybody equally. Um, thank you, Representative Almi, for the question. I have to confess, my memory on this is a little different than yours. Um, the, the original language of the bill, there was no cap at all. And uh, in House Ways and Means Committee, uh, there was significant concern about, well, how do we know what the uh, fiscal impact will be? How do we know how many people will be taking these credits? And the answer was, we didn't know, nor could we forecast, because it had never existed before, or at least hadn't existed since the, the mid-1990s. And so the decision was made, uh, first of all, that we need to somehow uh, create a cap to uh, make sure the state is not exposed you know, in a way that would be detrimental to the budget. And then the decision, and this was really uh, negotiation and pulling a number out of the air was to have it at a million dollars per year so we could see what the um, interest and and usage of the R&D tax credit was. And, and we all agreed to that. Uh, it, was, it, it was done by design. Um, as you've noted over the years, that's increased from uh, one million per year to the current seven million per year. And, and by the way, I would say at the one million per year, companies that applied in 2008 were only getting 41% of their request because of the $1 million cap. When it was increased to $7 million in 2017, uh, companies were now getting 92% of their request. So still not 100%, but close. That has gone down since 2017 and companies are now, as of 2020, receiving 76 percent. Um, and I guess the response, my response to your question would be, um, it's really a matter of state policy and what keeps it from going up to 50 million is, is that the state has this cap that, that uh, they won't go beyond and then it's a state decision if how closely they want that cap to match uh, demand for the R&D tax credit. Right now, they're matching at 75 cents on the dollar. Um, if anything, we would argue that it might be appropriate to increase uh, the cap. It hasn't been increased since 2017, but we're not asking for that this year. We, you know, everyone knows this is an unusual time in, in our country and in the state, and the budgeting process is going to be uh, difficult as it is. We're not asking for an increase, uh, but we are certainly opposing any type of decrease. Are there any further questions? Representative Oops. Representative Elliott. I need to tell Representative. Who's talking? Or push your space bar and talk and hold up. Yep, sorry. Uh, I, I don't have a question for the present speaker. But my question is for Representative Lang. It's a simple question. On page one, line 18 and 19, where it says exemptions, each taxpayer shall have the following exemptions. Uh, Representative Lang is, is Can not here right now. Can you hear me, Mr. Speaker? I mean, Mr. Chairman? Representative Elliott, uh, Representative Lang doesn't happen to be uh, in the room with us right now. All right, maybe you know then the uh, answer on line 19, income of $3,500. It doesn't say how long that is. And the previous speaker mentioned that the average per week is $1,145 a week, which comes to almost $60,000. So I don't understand line 19 where it says income of $3,500. How long is that for? Does anybody know? And how can you live on that? That's one year, Bob. That's for one year? Yeah. Yeah. On um, Representative Elliott, that's only the interest in dividends. Oh, okay. That's that, that's not their total income, that's just on the dividend. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Um, 
I don't see any other raised hand right now. If there is, raise your hand. Since there's no other raised hand, we will go to Devin uh, Rodkert from the DRA. Uh, I'd like to say a few words. Devin. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman, members of the committee. This is Devin Roderick again, financial analyst of the New Hampshire Department of Revenue, Tax Policy, and Legislative Analysis Group. Testifying with me is Melissa Rollins. Um, could you promote or unmute her as well at this time? You want to go to uh, Melissa Rollins? If you could, if you could unmute yep. both of us, that'd be great. Thank you. I'm unmuted, Devin. Thank you. So. HB uh, 210 section one would increase the filing threshold from 24 to 3,500. In section two, it increases the additional exemptions of being blind, disabled, or 65 years of age or older, um, including spouses from 1,200 to 1,750. These two sections would take effect January 1st, 2022, and apply to tax years ending on or after December 31st, 2022. We applied these changes to tax year 2018 data, and it would have resulted in a decrease in revenue of about 5.1 million. Lastly, it is important to note that this does not take into account any overpayments or credits that are on file, much like the previous bill. Section three of the proposed legislation, as previously explained, decreases the aggregate amount that we can award for the R&D tax credit program from 7 million down to 2 million. Um, for any fiscal year effective July 1st, 2021. This would result in an increase of up to 5 million state general and education trust fund revenues. The DRA cannot determine a potential increase in revenue in future years because it has no way of knowing the extent to which they would use these previously awarded R&D tax credits. Um, because it's important to note that the R&D tax credit in New Hampshire has a uh, basically a five-year carry forward. They're able to use that R&D tax credit toward business liability within the five subsequent taxable periods beyond the period in which it's earned. If you have any other any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Okay. Does the committee have any questions? <laughs> Representative Allen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On um, Devin and, and Melissa on um, two things. One of them, could you give us a historical list of the numbers that got the tax credit since it began per year and how much they got each time of that 50,000 cap. Yes, that's uh, actually provided in, in the New Hampshire Department of Revenue um, Research and Tax Credit Summary. We'll be more than happy to forward that along to the members of the committee. I believe um, Mr. Jouvet did mention the email that this morning yes. as well, but we can go uh -huh. ahead and forward that to you. Um, oh, good. If, includes, if it's in his email, I didn't have a chance to look at it yet. I had another meeting. That's no problem. And, and just to confirm, all, um, I believe all the information he gave you off that chart was accurate. Um, when you see that chart, um, just note that the, the, the top of the chart is obviously the first year of the program. And if you were to look to the far right of that chart, it shows the percentage of requested value that's actually awarded. So the R&D tax credit is based on 10% of qualified wages to New Hampshire capped at 50,000 or prorated, whichever is lesser of the three. Every year of the program as previously stated, the requested amounts have exceeded the amount that the Department of Revenue can award. So every year there's a proration that's applied equally across all applicants. Those percentages are listed in the far right of the chart. Thank you. The other question was, I wasn't able to be here for the last bill, but in the last bill, you calculated on the base of tax year on 19. And for this one, you use tax year 18. Yeah, that uh, was, and for another one, I think it was tax year 20. So uh, for these for these two IND bills, that was a timing thing of when we when we received the fiscal note, when we completed it. I did take a look at the um, applied this bill to tax year 2019 liability, and the difference was minimal, it was about four hundred thousand dollar difference on the IND portion of this bill. 
So the number, the, the overall impact did not change very much with this, depending on which tax year you applied it to. Normally, I, I can't speak to the other bill that you mentioned at tax year 20, but we don't have complete data for tax year 20 yet. So in this particular instance, I, I would not have used that for, for IND analysis. Thank you. No problem. Any further questions? Seeing none. Uh, any questions? Then on, on the blue sheet. Opposing the bill is Nicole Audrey, a member of the public, also a Liz Tentarelli, a member of the public, support of the bill, Senator Reagan. Opposing is Val Nanchuk, who uh, we prefer today in the testimony to run a small company, less than 25 employees. Bob Green su supports the bill. And Tina Harley supports the bill. Ken, uh, Representative Weiler supports the bill. Actually, Bob Green and Harley both Representatives, member of the public, Eric Rothburn, opposes the bill. And uh, Tom Oleski, represent, supports the bill. Anybody else wish to support? or oppose the bill. I see nobody willing to do that. So I'm gonna close the, the hearing on House Bill 210. We're running about 25 minutes behind. So we'll go right into House Bill 353. This is an act establishing credit against RSA 77 for tax paid on income subject to taxation in another state. Representative, this is the prime sponsor. He has, he has joined us, Mr. Chairman, so he will introduce uh, virtually Representative okay. Abbas. Okay, us. Representative Abbas. Uh, you put him on, Jen. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning. This is Representative Daryl Abbas. I uh, represent Rockingham County District 8. I want to just thank the members of the committee for uh, hearing me today. Uh, the reason this bill, I put this bill forward is, so in an S Corp in Massachusetts that operates solely in Massachusetts, uh, what is occurring is a if you are a resident of New Hampshire, and even though you're operating solely in Massachusetts, you are paying a double tax on the income earned through being paid a dividends, a dividend as a shareholder of the corporation. Even if the, that S Corp operates solely in Massachusetts and all the work is performed there, but you just happen to reside in New Hampshire. Now, the problem occurs is that and why that's happening is in Massachusetts, the dividend that is paid, they are cl classifying that as an income tax. So it's being, it's categorized as an individual income tax, taxed at the same rate and just put into, uh, when you file your tax, that's what it falls under. Because in New Hampshire, we don't have an income tax and I pray to God we never do. We are class, New Hampshire, we classify that as a dividends tax. So what is happening is, that normally if they, they were both an income tax, they would be an offset from between the states. But we are not, New Hampshire is not offering that offset or that credit because they're calling it something different. 
I looked, I always looked at that as when in Rome, if you're earning it in Rome, it should be taxed under Rome's law. So if you're operating solely in Massachusetts and all the work's done there, you just happen to have a New Hampshire address and that's where you reside, it shouldn't be called something different by New Hampshire. So it's been well set by Supreme, the Supreme Court on more than one occasion that a double taxation is unconstitutional and violates the dormant uh, commerce clause. And I would call this a violation of the dormant commerce clause. This, that's my interpretation. That, that it looks like that is happening. What, what I would say is that in this case, if anything, they would need to be an, an offset, which we're just not doing. Now, not everyone agrees with me on, on this. I, I have shown some of the research I've done to other members, and I understand there's a disagreement, but that aside, the disagreement aside, I still look at it as a bad policy. It would completely disincent anyone from who's a shareholder in a, a corporation from wanting to live in New Hampshire if they primarily working in, in another state, having to pay that state's income tax and New Hampshire's dividends tax. It just, to me, that's an extra high cost that you can be paying in taxes. So I, I look at, I really look at that as a, as a bad policy where if you don't agree with me on the legality of this, I would still ask that this uh, support in passing this. I have been asked a lot of questions about how, how would this impact the current uh, lawsuit going on that's before the Supreme Court. I don't believe this would have any, any influence on that because that's involving a person working in, solely in New Hampshire. It's not, and then they're being taxed, a income tax in Massachusetts. So it's actually somewhat the opposite. This is, this, in this scenario, the person, the individual is still working and operating in in Massachusetts, and they're still going there. To work. They're going there for work, and they're still being subject to the double taxation. I think it's very different when we're talking about an individual income tax, not the dividends, not the shareholder, just the actual employee. So I don't believe the two are, uh, would have any impact on each other. So I'm looking at this as something that would encourage people who are living here to stay here, but also even more people to move here. And I think it would really result in an economic boost, especially along the of bordering towns all, all through New Hampshire, not just the southern border. I think it would support the borders on both uh, by Vermont and Maine as well. And I can answer any questions. Thank you, Representative Abbas. Um, Representative Abron. Hey, Re Representative Abbas, uh, Rep Abrami here. Uh, I, I, I lived with this for 38 years. Uh, I think what you're, you're talking about is uh, distributions that are given. Uh, I was an owner of a company or co-owner of a company in Massachusetts. And then uh, when we incorporated as an S Corp, we didn't realize that distributions that I got to pay my income taxes, my federal taxes was treated, as, I also had to pay state uh, taxes on it uh, in Massachusetts, uh, but that distribution was counted as inc uh, uh, a dividend kind of an in uh, in uh, income in New Hampshire. So I, I for 38 years, I, I, I had to pay a double tax. I agree, th th this is a quirk and we had a bill about um, maybe eight years ago, seven years ago, uh, very much like this. Uh, where we we discussed this, and I was uh, I was very happy, thinking that this would get me out from underneath it. Uh, but what happened then was that the uh, we did the math on it, and there were a lot more winners than losers, or losers or winners, depending on which perspective you had in terms of state revenue. So, but I just want to clarify that's what you're talking about, though, correct? It's, it's distribution, and I think the DRA will. Uh, add a little clarity as well when they testify. But you're talking about distributions? I mean, I mean that's exactly what I'm talking about, the, the distributions from being paid a, a dividend. And I'm sorry that you had to do that for 38 years, because I, I look at that, that, the case that I'm referenced from the Supreme Court that clarified this came out in 2015. And the, the caution with that, and I understand they can be winners and losers, but the caution is, is that Maryland lost and what happened to Maryland is, and I believe another state, Wisconsin, they had to refund 
a, a lot of tax revenue to, to, a ta to the taxpayers. So there is a, a concern that if someone were to challenge this and be successful, and I know if it was me and I just to, to give full disclosure, I don't have any share. I don't own any shares in any S corporation. I'm just, if someone did challenge this, there can be a, a large bill that the state would have to pay. Uh, this doesn't necessarily uh, remove that liability, but it also, it is uh, been a talk amongst a lot of CPAs throughout uh, both states. And I've, I've had it, I've had even the conversation with my own CPA about it. Just, you know, what does he think? And, and it can be a big, big problem. This actually came to a head. So this is also a proactive situation, just kind of put, put an end to this. So it's not a problem going forward. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Representative Abbas, for bringing this to us today. Um, I, I'm going to give a little analogy and then ask you. I'm just trying to, to clear up my head on this. Um, I worked in the payroll uh, for many, many years, and uh, inside those computations, we would always get into arguments on whether or not you were going to be taxed where you live or where you work. And I had many different uh, conversations with those above me and the different companies that I worked for about that. Is this, is this sort of applying the same here? Uh, of what I'm understanding is that you live in New Hampshire, you're being taxed in New Hampshire and you're being taxed in Massachusetts. Is this a live work or a live operate uh, uh, suggestion here? It's, it's a, thank you for the question. It's actually more of a hybrid. So. The difference between just individual income tax, if you let's say you're working in New Hampshire remotely, but it's through a Massachusetts company, that scenario is the, where the individual's working. The dividend, the distribution payout has to do with the company of uh, the S Corp's profit margin, and then they're distributing some of those profits, making a distribution to its shareholders at a certain time. Those profits are then those are actually still realized in the other state. And that's the, that's the company, the ownership of the company is different than the individual income because that the company operation is still out of state. So in that case, it, to me, with, with this scenario, it's the reverse. You're being taxed because of where you live, but you're also being taxed because where the S Corp is performing. You're actually getting both. So my whole, the whole point of this is that you're getting hit twice where you should only be getting hit once, whether whether we agree that that should be paid to New Hampshire or that should be paid to Massachusetts, that's a different discussion, but you should not be paying both. Normally what happens is that the states will have a reciprocal agreement, but because the states are calling it different, they're classifying it differently and calling it apple and orange, there's, not, there's no offset. So that's the problem. There should be a credit and it should go both ways. If, if it was the reverse situation and you're a, incorporated in New Hampshire, but you solely live in Massachusetts, they're actually doing the same thing and they're violating it just as bad as the state of New Hampshire. I would say that's something that when you come to those agreements on the, on the offset, that's usually, that's a, that's a different conversation to have with, with the states because sometimes it is disproportionate, but that I, I would say it's, it's kind of in between the two because you're really getting hit twice. So regardless of where you live and where your company is, it's both. So that's the way I've always been. Thank you, Representative. Representative uh, Spilker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Representative Abbas. I think your explanation makes a great deal of sense, but I just want to make sure I understand correctly. We're not talking about dividends or distributions from companies you may own shares in that are located in other states. I think we're talking only about pass-through entities where the business tax goes on the personal return. Uh, in other words, partnerships, subchapter S, uh, and LLCs. Am I correct in making that distinction? So when I answer, your, when, let me answer this and just say that I am not a tax expert. I, I don't practice tax law. I'm not a certified CPA. So when, when I look at, I'm talking mo mostly with dividends paid through an S corporation. And when I look at that, that's what's getting to me I'm, is being taxed twice. The business profits tax, my understanding is, is not, Oh, it's not the same situation that if I'm wrong about that, then it, it would still be, but I still would think that's violating the, the commerce clause too. But I'm looking at this as where the person's working in Massachusetts. They're not contesting that they should be taxed in the Massachusetts. They're just, everything's done there. 
they just simply reside here. And by living here, you're being taxed a dividends tax that's already been taxed in Massachusetts, whether it's, but it's, whether it's an LLC or a partnership, it would be the same principle being violated. It just, it's just another analogy to be made. But I think there, I would put all those in the same category, but this is where it's happening the most. So, so just to clarify the way I'm understanding your answer, I don't believe this is a, a applies to a situation where a C corporation exists in another state and Massachusetts does not purport to apply a tax on a dividend sent to a resident of New Hampshire. It applies in the case of tax uh, pass through entities where the individual receiving the dividend or distribution is actually the person receiving the profit on the Massachusetts company. Correct. That, that, is, that is correct. Representative Alvin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On Representative Abbas, on it, I'm wondering on if you're you're asking us to unilaterally on remove ourselves from taxing anything that Massachusetts is taxing. It sounds like to me, because we can't get Massachusetts to do agreements with us, as far as I can tell. Um, do you realize that if we have lower taxes at the state level here, your property tax is going up? Thank you. Well, just to thank you for the question. First of all, I, I think that's an assumption that the property taxes go up. And to, to make a grand overbroad statement about how the local governments will change their tax rates. And I, I think that's, that's, over, that's too broad of a statement to make. And I, what I'm referring to here is, this is something the Supreme Court has decided. Whether I like it or not, is not, is, that's, I can have my own personal opinion on it, but I just look at this. This is something that they've ruled on several times saying a double taxation is inappropriate. And just, just like any other precedents, I, I'm looking at it and I see it happening. And I'll, and I'll be honest, if I was the plaintiff, or if, I, if I was hit with this, I would challenge it. And I would say, well, I'm not sure that you're allowed to do this. So that would cost the state a lot of money having to refund all that money. And I, when it comes to property taxes, if, if there was, I, there's already a lot of great incentives to live in New Hampshire. And it's, I, it's one of the, I would say the best state to live in the entire country. But there are people that would make the financial decision to not live here for that reason simply to avoid this double taxation. I would believe that this would create a, a more of an incentive to move here, which would perhaps develop more areas, which would create more revenue in property taxes just by developing more homes, but it would also improve the economic activity in the area where you have people who perceivably have disposable income to spend to support local businesses. And there will be a lot of um, domino effects of actually having uh, getting rid of this. It's just not, it's not simply black and white like this. So I don't actually agree that real estate taxes would go up, especially along the, the bordering parts of the state. But I also believe that it is still a policy that's really, it's negatively impacting a lot of people. Chair, any further questions? Chair. Representative Shannon. Thank you, Mr. A question for you. Will we see a, a Fiscal note come on this from someone. We have two other people signed up to testify. One from the PI. All right. Thank you. Any further questions from this uh, representative? None. And we'll go to Eric Rathbun. And thank you, members of the committee. Good morning. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Then we'll go to <coughs> Carolyn Lear, who's on the DRA. Okay. She's neutral on this, and she's going to testify. Carolyn. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Carolyn Lear, and I'm the Assistant Commissioner at the New Hampshire Department of Revenue. Um, and I think Representative Abbas did a really nice job of really framing this issue for you all. 
um, I took his testimony to really frame this as a two part issue for you to consider. One would be to consider whether to amend the interest in dividends tax statute because of constitutionality concerns. And the other is for you to amend the statute based on um, sort of a policy uh, policy based cost benefit analysis. Is this good for New Hampshire? Um, and I would like to address both of those sort of issues in turn. So relative to the constitutionality of how um, New Hampshire taxes um, the pass through income of resident S corporation shareholders. Um, I think all I would caution you with is this idea of conceding the unconstitutionality of the statute. Um, I think if we were to get this as a lawsuit, we would say that it is not unconstitutional. Um, the reason being that um, New Hampshire and Massachusetts really has a functionally different method of taxing both individuals and businesses. Um, in Massachusetts, as everyone correctly heard, if you're a corporation, you will pay income tax at the corporate level. And then if the shareholders receive income from that corporation, um, they will also pay um, income tax on those distributions. Somewhat different in Massachusetts is that an S corporation doesn't pay tax at the entity level. Those profits just get sent right down to their shareholders. And as Representative Abbas mentioned, are tax. If those shareholders um, are in New Hampshire, we then look to um, those shareholders for IND tax. And that's very similar to what we would do to a shareholder of a C Corp or a partner in a partnership. Um, so for that reason, we would just caution on just conceding that constitutional issue. I think we might want to assert um, that the IND tax is just different from what Massachusetts is doing and perhaps consistent with our overall scheme of how we tax um, interest um, of individuals and tax businesses at the entity level. Moving on to sort of the more policy-based reason why you might want to um, consider this bill, as you might expect, we don't really take a position on that. I think that's for you folks to really um, evaluate and decide. I know there was some interest earlier in the potential fiscal impact of this legislation we were not asked to do a fiscal note for this legislation. And I'm not sure that we would have the data to come up with a good um, fiscal note for this bill. But um, I would suspect um, that it would have a fiscal impact simply be because of the cross border nature of a lot of shareholders in New Hampshire who live in New Hampshire but own an interest in an entity that's in Maine or Massachusetts or Vermont um, where there are income taxes. Um, so it could have a fiscal impact. And I think that's really not my prerogative to sort of weigh in on whether um, the costs and benefits work out. Otherwise, I am happy to answer any questions from the committee. Um. Representative Brown. Hi, Ms. Lear, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. So as I mentioned earlier, this issue came up uh, probably seven or eight years ago. Um, and it came up even before then. There was a commission that looked at all our taxes. Um, and maybe Representative Major and, and I guess I don't remember this. And it was identified that this was one of our more quirky kind of thing of the way we tax businesses. Uh, I remember that word clearly, it was quirky. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but at that time, and when, when this became a bill, it was a bill that we dealt with, uh, we did get some estimates of revenues. Uh, and maybe it was a rough estimate, 
uh, because that's what made the committee shy away from doing anything about this because it, it was it was it appeared that there'd be a lot of lost revenue to the state at a time when we couldn't afford that lost revenue. Now, obviously, I was I would have been a beneficiary of, of this bill, that, you know, this type of bill passing when I was still working. Uh, I'm retired now, so. Uh, but um, so, it, is there any way possible that we can get at least a rough estimate of somehow fiscal of a fiscal note on this? I could take that back to um, our financial analysts and see what they could come up with. Um, perhaps we could cross-reference if there's any Massachusetts or federal data available that might help us hone in on a rough estimate. Right, okay, I appreciate whatever you could do, thank you. Sure. Representative Ames. Thank you. You accidentally muted yourself. Okay. Here you go. All right. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, my question goes to the uh, uh, point made by Representative Abrami, the question or request for a fiscal note. I think we really need to have a fiscal note. I understand it may be difficult. All fiscal notes, in fact, have difficulties uh, and um, we get uh, in the course of DRA doing a fiscal note, we get a good explanation of what the bill in fact, uh, as they understand it, would, would do. And I think we really need that in this case because there was uh, confusion, I think, amongst uh, those who were asking questions and, uh, and uh, the answers given. Um, and it left me wondering, scratching my head, exactly what is the, uh, situation that's of concern. Uh, so I really hope that we can get a, a, a fiscal note from DRA that explains their understanding of the bill and then um, their um, identification if they can't do a bottom line estimate of the factors, uh, the cost factors uh, that go both ways that would weigh into the impact. So uh, that's my uh, uh, it's really a request to DRA. Representative Abramian has a question. Uh, yeah, another question, uh, Ms. Lair. Uh, could you help us out and, and direct us to exactly where in the statutes uh, we should be looking for? You find the lines in the in the statute, current statutes that make these out-of-state distributions taxable. In New Hampshire. Um, excuse me. So as not to um, waste your time, perhaps I could follow up in an email with um, identification of the exact provisions as I try to pull them up. Oh, um, that's what I was requesting. I didn't okay, make it. sure. Uh, Absolutely. Oh, you. Sorry, I misunderstood. Oh, no, no, I didn't want you to have him scramble now to do that. Thank you. Perfect. It would be helpful. Thank you. Representative Almey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On Carolyn, can we, is there some way that we could get um, a history for the last 10 years or more of, of uh, the number of high income uh, payers of the IND that have uh, disappeared. I know some of them will have disappeared simply because they died. Uh, but we've had uh, both, I think this bill and the ones before it talking about high income people leaving the state because of this tax. And my remembrance of what the state demographer has been telling us the last couple of times is that we have more low-income people leaving and high-income people coming in. Thank you. Sure, I can take a look at that. Any further questions? 
Anybody else who wish to testify for or against this bill? Saying none, then I close the public hearing on House Bill 553. Yeah. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Could I just ask, there was another bill that um, we were trying to get a fiscal note on, and I'm trying to remember which number it is now, um, but that on, they told us that we'd have to do a vote in committee in order to ask for one. Oh, it was the uh, 346 funding source for domestic violence programs. Okay, that's, that's not for today. No, it's not until the 17th, but it takes a while to get those fiscal notes sometimes. You know, I, I will ask to see if we can get a fiscal note without having to make a vote. Um, if I remember correctly, you told me that they said we had to do a vote in committee in order to ask for one. And I remember that from previous rules too. We've never done it. But we've never had this many bills without fiscal notes that should have had them. HB 102 also should have a fiscal note, but uh, I don't think that the sponsor expects it to, to go ahead as an actual bill, but as a retained study. I will ask him again, and otherwise get a negative answer and we will have a vote. Any other questions from the committee? I just have a comment. I'm having a hard time hearing you, Representative Major. Is this better? Yes, thank you. Yes, it comes off and on. Oh. And then I will take it off when I speak. Any further questions from the committee before we take our extended lunch? And then move back at one o'clock. If not, Yes. Are we through for the morning? Till one o'clock. We're through till one. Yes, that's right. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Representative Griffin. Representative Elliott, if you like, you can um, look at the bottom left of your screen and you can press mute and you can press stop video if you want to just um, set it and just be able to come back later. Stop video. Mm -hmm. Now your box is just black with your name on it. And then if you press mute, then nobody will hear any background noise. Perfect.
Hi, Representative Major, Representative Verstein, Representative Abrami, anybody else in the room? Um, just a reminder, if someone would go up to the computer station and press unmute before you're ready to begin. Go to where, Jen? No, uh, just for people in the committee room. Oh, okay, gotcha. Mm -hmm. Representative Tucker, how'd your testimony go? You're muted. I had written, I had some written testimony, so I just synopsized that. I don't think I was brilliant. Can I do a mic check just to see? Testing, testing, can, can you folks hear me? Yes, Representative Rami. Okay, uh, Jennifer, can you tell me, can you tell us if uh, uh, Sharon Packard's uh, out there somewhere on? on... Um, I do not see him in the attendee list, no. At all, huh? Okay. Um, He's supposed to be introducing the bill. <laughs> no, not at this time. I, I, my dog get taken care of. I got a text saying, "Do you want me to feed her?" Load off. Your mics are live, by the way. This is the very yeah. Mics are live. Yes, yes. be ever. I already you. got a hand up. Kim Morgan. <laughs> <Oregon. laughs> okay, so that's uh, there's a mic right here. Thanks for doing that too. <laughs> okay, everybody, uh, we're gonna we're gonna start the afternoon session. Uh, you're probably wondering why I'm sitting in the chair seat. Uh, uh, for the new members, Norm Major is a sponsor of this bill. A co-sponsor, a co-sponsor of the bill. Uh, therefore, he can't speak on the bill. Uh, so I'm going to be chairing this one and the next one as well. So. Uh, our understanding is that Sharon Packard is the prime sponsor on this bill uh, and that he, he was uh, supposed to be testifying. He's still not there, uh, Jennifer or Jenny? No. All right, what we're gonna do is have, uh, we're gonna have Representative Major uh, introduce the bill. You wanna sit over here, folks? I can trade with you. There's one over here too. Oh, there's one there too. That, yeah, that one's probably in the middle. There you go. Can you hear me? Can you hear me okay? Not yes. very well. Can he sit at the table? Can you guys hear uh, the chairman? Not very well. Okay. Um, Do you want to move it up? That's mine. Yeah, why don't, we, why don't we move it back up there, Norm? Do it like, like I did. Yep. All right, we're, we're just going to do a little uh, rearranging here. A little closer, a little closer. How's this, can you hear me? Try again. Can you hear me okay? No, I don't know, what does everybody think? Sort of. It's struggle to hear him at all. Edith saying, get closer to your microphone and Representative Hack and Phillips can't hear you. Is that better? Yes. Right? Yeah. That was a good yes. <laughs> that was a good yes. All right. I just need to get the bill. Doing 10. So this is uh, uh, House Bill 10 uh, that that's going to be introduced by uh, Representative Major uh, right now. 
okay, I'm going to enter this House Bill 10 and act relative to the rates of the business profits tax and business enterprise tax. And the prime sponsor was Representative Sharon Packard. The reason why I'm looking to be here right at this moment. But essentially, what this bill does, it brings the business profits tax rate from 7.7%, which it is now, in two years, now to 7.5%. It brings the business enterprise tax from the rate of 0.60% now to 0.5%. Two years from now. And this is the plan schedule in the, the rate reduction in business profit tax was introduced a number of years ago. Warren? No. Sir? Representative Packard. Oh, Representative Packard is here, so. You want to take over from your Yeah, well, we're right on time here. Uh, Oh, Mr. Speaker. Okay. Okay. So Rep Representative uh, Packard's uh, going to pick up mid sentence here. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Yes. Uh, Can I question? say welcome, Mr. Speaker? Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's good to see you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, I'm not sure how far uh, Norm got, but um, this is, uh, I think most of you realize, this was one of our. Uh, former speaker was Jake Hinch's uh, bills, and when he passed away, I took over. It, uh, I'm sure every, all of you have read it, pretty simple. It um, reduces the business profits tax and the business enterprise tax until we get down to 7.5% for the business profits and 0.5% for the business enterprise tax. That's what it does. <laughs> Thank you. Get much simpler than that. You probably all are either going to agree with it or disagree with it, <laughs> but that's that's the whole context of the bill. Uh, or, or you, uh, you want to take questions? I'll take some questions. Okay, I'll let some Schomburg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Packard, for making the presentation. At least a simple bill here. I, I do have a question. Uh, do you have any uh, data that shows of a tax rate reduction in the BPT? or the BET as proposed by this bill would have a positive impact on state revenues? Well, I mean, being perfectly honest, we're not 100% sure it would have a positive impact, but we do know that when you reduce taxes, it has a positive impact on business and uh, business enterprise and the money that extra, the business extra money that they have to spend. So we believe it's an absolute positive move forward that will bring more business into the state. It will help businesses in the state stay in business mm -hmm. and uh, help them expand once we get out of the pandemic. Thank you, Representative. Uh, any other questions? I, I don't have a computer in front of me, so can someone, uh, Jen, Jen, can you, Jenny, can you? Representative Almond. Okay, Representative Almond, please. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I just wanted at this point to bring up a procedural on a problem in our RSAs, which has been there since you started cutting the business taxes on that I just realized on in both the business profits tax and the business. We just lost our audio on Alan. Almy, you, you muted yourself accidentally. Myself, I don't know what mutes you again. Um, I do apologize. Um, I don't know when, where I started, but on um, I want to read from uh, section 77A, 20A, distribution of funds for the business profits tax. And the business enterprise tax uh, is approximately the same thing. The commissioner shall determine the additional amounts of revenue produced by an increase of 1.5% in the rate of tax imposed by 77A2 for each fiscal year and shall certify such amounts 
to the state treasurer by October 1 of that year for deposit in the education trust fund established by RSA 19839. Uh, now, I've consulted Phil Sletton of the New Hampshire Fiscal Policy Institute. He says that people have been finessing this for quite a while, but essentially what they're saying is that if each time you lower the tax, less money should be going into the education trust fund. So my question is, is this going to be amended? And if so, in which way are we going to continue to ignore the law and just send what we originally promised to the education uh, trust fund? On, or are we going to remove it from the general fund? Who's going to lose on this? Thank you. Well, it's an assumption, uh, Representative, that we're going to lose on this. We don't believe you are going to lose in the long run. So I guess I would just have to disagree with your assessment. Okay, any other, uh, oh, any other, oh, I guess we do have two more questions. Uh, uh, Edith, Edith uh, Tucker, please, Senator, Representative Tucker. Yes, uh, did you consider lowering the business enterprise tax more, and why did you reject that as an as a as an outcome? I'm I'm, I'm not sure. I you mean to reduce it below 0.5 percent? Yeah. Uh, this. Well, honestly, Representative, this is the bill that Representative Finch had written. I just took over the fine sponsorship of it. So obviously I can't ask him why he picked 0.5%. I was around when the business enterprise tax was first put in place. And that was back, I think, in 1973. And at that point it was 0.25. And it's raised, it went up as high as 0.275. And now we're bringing it, we're suggesting that you bring it back to uh, half, half of that, uh, really, uh, point five oh. Could I follow up, please? Let's follow up. Uh, the reason I ask is that my understanding is that the BET really is the, the sort of the mom and pop branch of New Hampshire. This is the group that has really been pained and hurt by the pandemic. So I was wondering whether we shouldn't be considering even a lower amount for the BET. Representative, anytime you want to lower taxes, I'm fine with it. I'm sorry, I couldn't understand you. Rep Representative, anytime you want to lower taxes, you won't get an argument from me. I'm absolutely fine with it. The committee so, wants to lower it more, that's fine with me. Great, thank you very much. Well, uh, we still got two more questions. Still want to take questions? Uh, Tim Horgan, please, please uh, let him in. Representative Horgan. Representative Abrami, I'm sorry. Representative Horgan signed up to testify on the bill. Oh, he did. Okay. That's what he's trying to indicate. So, uh, uh, Drew, uh, just a question from uh, Drew Klein. Oh, Drew Klein's not a, a member, so he can't ask a question. So uh, I guess we're all set then. Uh, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Next up is going to be Representative Major, who, uh, Representative Major, uh, have you shared, uh, for us in the room, he uh, handed out two charts. Representative Major hand, handed out two charts. Uh, I don't know, does, does everybody else have access, um, online have access to these two charts? Oh. Um. Why don't you share the screen? Uh, again, I don't have a computer in front of me. Uh, no, I guess we don't. I guess we don't have it. But Norm, uh, Representative Major will talk us through the charts and then uh, make sure that everybody gets these, these charts uh, afterwards. Representative Major? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, the, the two charts are put together so to better understand what's happening to the BPP and the BET when you change the rate and what, and what happens to the revenues. That question was already asked. 
what I did is I made a copy of the chat from one of the handouts that was given to us from our organization. And it's on page 17, I believe, on the LDA. It's the VPT VET regular 10 year trend. And I looked at that, and that 10 year trend was from 2011 to 2020. And what's striking, if you take from 2011 to 2015, that was before there was any great changes in VET or VPT, that the changes in the total revenue, business revenue in those years went from $490.2 million to $561 million or a $71.5 million increase from 2011 to 2015, 14.6% increase. And that was the VPT rate of 8.5%, which I've been in there for a while, and the VPT rate of 0.75%. The next four years, from 2015 to 2019, we started reducing the rates of the business profits and the business enterprise tax, where we went from a rate of eight and a half percent in 2015 to 7.7 percent in 2019, over four rate drops from 8.5 to 8.2, 7.9, 7.7 percent, which is a total drop of eight and a half, of 0 0.8 percent. In the same time, we dropped the rate of the BET from 0.75 percent to. 0.6% over that same time period, over four different rate drops. And what happened to the revenues? Well, the revenues prior to the rate drop over those four years had risen 14.6%. Over the next four years, in dropping the rates of the BPT and the BET, the revenues grew $243.9 million, or a total of 43.7% in, in four years. The previous four years, without any rate drops, the revenue increased 14.6%. Let me say that again. In these four years, when you saw the rate drops, the revenues increased by $243.9 million. So that question of what happens when you make rate drops and to the revenues, in this case, what it did, it encouraged more economic activity, which encouraged greater revenues. Thank you. Question. Press the button. Any other questions? Of Lieutenant Major? Uh, oh, uh, Representative Almi. Uh, Major, get on mute. Get on mute. Unmute. Sorry. I suggest that we first compare these growth rates with uh, the national GDP and the stock market rates, which seem to have quite a lot to do with our, our tax growth. Um, and also would remind you, I think it was 2016, the first year there that you're talking about, that we finally recovered from the Great Recession and started to grow again. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there a question? Just a comment. Um, no, well, the, the question was, uh, shouldn't we compare it with the source of our revenue, which is mostly outside the, outside the state? Representative Major, you want to respond to that? Uh, what I did in this announcement, look at the total revenue growth. 
the revenue is made up of the corporate taxes. Yes, a lot of the corporate taxes comes from corporations outside the state on the profits that they make in that state. And uh, the reason they make profits within that state is because the economy is growing and they're delayed to be able to buy the products. We don't tax corporations on the profits that they make outside the state. As far as the GDP, if you look, the Great Recession was 07, 08, 09. It took a while to come out. Started this analysis in 2011. In 2011, the growth was stagnant. I mean, it went up from 2011, $490 million. Five hundred and sixteen million in two thousand twelve, five fifty one in two thousand thirteen, and five forty nine in two thousand fourteen. In two thousand fifteen, it's five sixty one. It was the growth was it was almost flat. Then in two thousand sixteen, we had our first rate reduction, and it was a six ninety nine. And then through 2019, $805.6 million. So it was quite a steep growth in those four years while we were reducing rates. Okay. Um, okay, we're set with that. Then uh, Representative Ames and then Representative Schomburg. Representative Ames, please, first. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I guess my question is uh, along the same lines as the question that was just asked. And um, I think uh, we all know that there are <coughs> many variables that affect uh, the uh, profits reported by our ta the taxable businesses in New Hampshire. Um, and those variables obviously uh, uh, then, um, well, the variables in the tax collected um, is dependent on um, the uh, factors that Representative Almi spoke to, um, and to the. Uh, and I'm not saying this very well. There, there's there are tax rates, and there's the profit amount. And the amount of profit that's reported each year is a function of many things. And one is the larger national economy, another is the international economy, and another is the state economy. And then the amount collected depends on the rates. And I, my question to you, Representative Major, is wouldn't you agree that in making any judgment uh, as to how what the impact of a rate change at the state level has been would be um, that a very careful assessment of those other factors, including uh, changes in the federal tax law, for example, um, is needed. And that when you go through such an examination, it's, uh, it's not easy to draw the kind of conclusions that you suggested we should draw um, from uh, uh, from the data you were looking at? The amount of vectors involved. I'm, I'm having a hard time hearing you. I'm sorry. Got to, got to talk into the microphone, uh, Representative. You're right. The amount of vectors involved in determining. Uh, Representative Major? Yes. You may want to take your face mask down with the help. He's very socially distanced for those not in the room. Right. There's at least six feet apart between us. Yeah, you're right. There's a lot of vectors involved in, in determining what the economic effects are going to be on total revenue. 
GDP is in uh, unemployment. Right now it's the pandemic, rate changes, a lot of areas. But overall, what I did is I looked at the two periods. During the, per the first period of four years, you had all kinds of things going on. The same as you had all kinds of things going on in, in another four years. But the sum of everything is that while these rate changes were going on, There wasn't a year that wasn't any better. That was worse than the previous four years of changes in the year. So I would conclude from that that this does show where rate changes and their very small incremental rate changes did not was not detrimental to the total income coming in. But there is, you know, if you lower the rate, you may just get more businesses to come in here. More businesses would generate more revenues. Representative Ames, you said? I think I am for now. I. I uh look forward to continuing dialogue and discussion with Representative Major and others as we go into work sessions to look at the facts. Facts are facts. And uh, we uh, can try to uh, come to a common understanding of what has happened to help us forecast what will happen. I think this is very murky territory. I'm sure Representative Major would agree. Uh, it's incredibly complex as he says there are many different vectors <coughs> come into play and uh, let's all look at it together and do an honest assessment uh, if uh, yeah I'll leave it at that and I certainly would love to be, uh, I'll be glad when we can sit down and, and go over this together. yes uh, I, I agree We're, we are definitely have work session on this bill so uh, so there's two more uh, members Nope. Uh, okay, Representative uh, Schomburg waves off. Uh, Representative Ullery, do you have a question of uh, Representative Major? There it is. Yes. Um, if I recall correctly in the past, it, with the exception of the tobacco tax, when there's been a modification downward of our taxes, there's been an increase in revenue. Uh, yes, Susan, I see you smiling. <laughs> That's the nice thing about this distance stuff. At any rate, I remember getting um, some uh, facts as Representative Ames uh, spoke about uh, from uh, LBA regarding what has happened in uh, over time whenever we've done this. Uh, that may be helpful, uh, don't you agree, Representative uh, Major? Yes. And you know, there are certain things that aren't as complex, such as the beer tax. If we raise, if we lower the rate on that, it would definitely reduce our revenues because the same set over the years, the volume of the beer that is taxed has been very consistent. So definitely, if you're right there, then you can lower the revenue. Okay, uh, any other questions of Representative Major? I see none, thank you very much, Representative. So look, we have uh, two other, uh, well, we have uh, one other uh, individual who had signed up in the pink card, if you will, and then we have Department of Revenue, and then we have two other hands that are up. So I'm gonna start with Department of Revenue and then uh, Greg Moore, you're next. Tim, Representative Horgan, you're next after that. And then Drew Klein, you're next after that. So let's start with Department of Revenue. Let's, uh, I, I, do you want to be honest? Uh, Melissa Rollins and uh, Carolyn Laird, do you want to do this together? Oh, can we, can we yeah. open them up both together? Great, thank you, Representative Abrami. Thanks for promoting both Carolyn Lear, the Assistant Commissioner of the Department of Revenue, as well as myself, Melissa Rollins, Senior Financial Analyst with the Department of Revenue. 
I just want to make sure you can hear me first. Yes, Ken. Okay, perfect. All right. So I, um, you seem pretty familiar with the bill so far. It's been explained very well that the business rates go down twice in this bill. So I'm just going to speak to our fiscal note and our fiscal analysis. We have provided a fiscal note quick guide, which basically mirrors the fiscal note that you have in front of you that's back to the bill. So if you want to look at that while I'm chatting, it might make a little bit more sense as I go through. First off, I want to note this is a static analysis. Our fiscal impact is indeterminable. During the static analysis, our starting point was fiscal year 2020 cash basis plus anomalous revenue. You've heard us in the past couple of weeks talk a lot about this anomalous revenue. You know that it belongs back in fiscal year 20. So our starting point for business taxes as a whole is the 69 or 697.5 million. So we take that amount and then we need to tweak it a little bit to get it to be the true amount for fiscal year 20 which is bringing it to 691.5 million. And that's because you've heard me speak before about how tax years cross multiple fiscal, fiscal years. And in fiscal year 20, we are feeling the last impact of, or excuse me, in fiscal year 21, we're feeling the last impact of our last rate reduction. So we need to adjust for that prior to this bill being um, put forth. So our starting point is 691.5 million. We then take that amount and we apply the applicable rates based on each fiscal year to get our to get us to our bases. And once we have the bases, we then are applying the rates as we move forward. And the reason we have the chart that's in the sheet, it's called proposed legislation rates and splits. It's a good visual to show you how the tax years cross each fiscal year because there's a lot of moving parts when making this calculation. So using those rates and splits and applying the base to each of those race, rates and splits, we end up with a final estimated cumulative fiscal impact starting in fiscal year one, fiscal year 21 of negative 5.9 million with a total cumulative fiscal impact of 53.7 million in fiscal year 24, which is the time we'll feel the full impact of all of those rate changes. Happy to answer any questions. Any questions from anyone? Any hands up? Okay, thank you. I'm sure we'll be talking to you uh, both more about this as we uh, proceed forward on this. Oops, I think Representative Almy has a question. Oh, yes. I, I can't see hands one. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I need, uh, Danny, I need your help on, on that. So, so Represent Representative Almy. Yep. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I was wondering, we're starting with fiscal year 20, which is probably going to be our lowest, but it may be our second lowest. We won't know until April on, on revenue on to the state from this, these taxes. And so it really is how much we actually lose from this is going to depend on how much revenue we get from uh, the re rebound from the uh, recession, though that in the past has always been slower in New Hampshire than elsewhere. Uh, what I was asking for, other than why we started in 20, um, is you're using for this whole thing, the division of BET from BPT, according to the 37% that it was in 20. Uh, but we know that, we hope that a lot of that is going to change again towards the 40% that you always used as the general number. Um, once we are all are vaccinated for COVID, which in my case is gonna be a long time, uh, and uh, could go back to restaurants and the restaurants could start opening again. Given that they've turned a lot, hopefully they're going to come back almost to what they were before. So uh, the BET should be growing back relative to BPT. And I'm not sure what that does to your conclusions. Yeah, that, that's a great point, Representative Elmi. We do always try to 
put in a little note to say if the starting point of our revenue is adjusted, then our revenue impact will be off. It's very hard. We did we did do this um, these fiscal impacts at the end of fiscal year, um, excuse me, at the end of December, beginning of November. So we weren't exactly sure where fiscal year 21 was going to end. And because of COVID, it made it really hard to say, let's use fiscal year 21 plan because we weren't, we weren't sure at that time if we were even going to meet plan or not. So our safest guess at that point was to use fiscal year 20. So obviously if the revenues increase or if that split does change between the BET and BPT, there will be some impacts. However, I'm not sure if it will be a drastic impact just because of the bet credit against the BPT might offset that mm -hmm. a little bit. All right. I was wondering if we could possibly get just one sensitivity analysis on that for this this group. I mean, we've we've never really looked at the impact of of the BET. Um, BPT split. Ms. Rollins, you, you want to respond to that? Sure, we can. We can look into that and see if we can come up with um, see if we can come up with a sensitivity analysis to see how much it does impact it or not. We can absolutely take a look at that. So, so for all the members, you know, we're going to get into the weeds with Bar Review on this one. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, these deco when we do our work sessions, I'm sure we're going to we're going to dig into this. So. So uh, any other questions for uh, Melissa Rollins? No, okay, thank you, Melissa. Thank you. Um, I wanna to apologize to Representative Harg and uh, protocol is that representatives go before others. So I'm, I'm gonna call on Representative Harg if you're still there. Oh, I'm still there. I just start speaking now or do you wanna add me to the panel? I'm happy either way. You're not missing much by not being able to okay. see me. Can you speak so louder, I... Representative? We can't hear you. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, so I guess so you, so this is, I guess right now I'm a, an attendee, but I'm, I'm able to speak. That's good enough. You won't be able to see me probably, but you're not missing much. Um, so I'm in opposition uh, opposition to this bill. I think, um, I think it would do nothing but reduce the amount of revenue coming into the state. And um, both the speaker and Reverend Major made what are what many of you recognize as Laffer curve arguments for the tax cuts, which is supposedly when you cut taxes, business activity will go up so much you'll get the same revenue or more. Um, that's an unrealistic assumption. I actually studied economics with uh, Dr. Laffer and I don't know whether he would have been opposed or in favor of this bill. He actually probably would have been more likely in favor. But um, first of all, the rates at which that kicks in are much higher than um, higher than what the rate of our business taxes and business profits have been or enterprise tax. So the inflection point on that curve where you start losing money raised taxes is for most types of taxes way up around 90%. You know, we're talking about 0.55% of something of you know, the business profits tax versus just on profits, which is just part of what businesses take in. You know, it's whatever is seven, seven point seven percent now. Um, the business enterprise tax, which is kind of like an income tax, but it's paid by the uh, employer not by the employee and it's not every employer and every employee so I guess that makes it narrow enough not to be a broad-based income tax but it works very much like the income tax of everybody who works for a covered um, thing that's 0.6 percent and I think these are also the Laffer curve effect you know the supply side effect kicks in only when the uh, when only, only when there's a, a significant uh, change, when there's also there's structural changes that can kick in, and um, also people have to be confident it's going to stick around. And none of these apply to this. You could probably totally eliminate the business enterprise tax, and you do nothing but lose all that revenue. I think that would probably have little or no effect on businesses. Um, bis also, growth in business it um, relies a lot more than low taxes. Um, you need you need a good government for businesses to grow. You need Businesses need a workforce, you know, they need a judicial system, they need transportation, they need all kinds of things that government pays for. So like at least some of what government does is very beneficial to the business community. So, and also um, the government also is a major customer for private business. So they're one of the largest, uh, you know, they're for many, many businesses rely on the government as a, as a customer too. And of course also government spending we also saw that it's not inherently bad for the economy when we had essentially 
$1.25 billion of free, virtually free federal money was dumped on us, you know, government spending, um, government spent it all and um, the economy improved as a result. So it didn't. Mr. Hogan, government's, Representative yeah. Morgan, uh, yeah. we're really running behind. Um, yes, my last comment is, um, Thank you. last comment is, um, these tax cuts are the way they are because, and it's been in there for several budget cycles, I think dating back to the 2015 budget. And uh, so there was a possibility the tax rate could go up if the economy shrank and it never shrank until uh, the pandemic happened. So we had an unexpected catastrophe. So it actually shrank for at least part of the year. So that was the first time a tax increase through these, the way these trigger, this law is written could even happen. And um, it was, uh, you know, the effect of the amount that it goes up would, would have gone up is very exaggerated. I remember even back then when we had the budget briefing, I asked uh, Neil Kirk, um, this looks like the tax rate could actually go up under certain circumstances. And I tend to be really amazed that such that he would consider such a thing. And um, he, he assured me and it was a reasonable answer that that would be virtually impossible. But then last year, many things that are virtually impossible actually happened. And one of them was that uh, these, these triggers that these, uh, you know, the economy shrank enough to trigger a possible tax increase. So anyway, I think, uh, you know, you'll have plenty of work sessions. I'm, my, I know a lot less about this than the, uh, than the committee and you'll have plenty of work sessions, a wide variety of uh, sessions. But I think, uh, I think this bill is a bad bill. I think it, it will do nothing except uh, just lower the revenue and we'd either have to, uh, Thank, thank you. Which we have to get it somewhere else. So that, that's that's why I'm opposed to it. So thank you, Representative Hargan. Uh, any questions for Representative Hargan? Oh, first off, do you willing to take questions? Sure. Representative? Yes, that's fine. Any any questions for the Representative Hargan? No. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right, thanks a lot. Thanks. Okay. Um, we have two more that will uh, want to testify. Uh, just for those who are waiting for the next meeting, uh, the next meeting, the next is uh, House Bill 15. We'll probably be another 10 or 15 minutes on this on this bill. So just hang in there, please. Thank you. Uh, Greg Moore from the American Americans for Pros uh, Prosperity, uh, New England chapter. Uh, you, can we uh, let Greg Moore in, please? I, I'm here. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm, I'm I'm glad I'm more punctual for this uh, hearing than for the one this morning. So, so I appreciate uh, your patience with that. Uh, as you may know, I'm uh, Greg Moore. I'm the state director with Americans for Prosperity here in New Hampshire. And for the veteran members of the committee, uh, you know that uh, we have long been proponents for reducing the state's two business, primary business taxes. And uh, we've been involved since this began, even before 2015. And we believe that this is as a hugely beneficial opportunity for the state to grow our economy. Uh, Representative Major did a great job of outlining how even with lower rates, the state was seeing record business tax revenues. And uh, I think it's important to look beyond just the impact on revenues. I know that's this committee's purview, but to look beyond the impact of revenue and look at the other economic factors and, and the impact that's having on the lives of people across the state. We saw tremendous job growth, wage growth. We had a workforce participation number that was uh, in the top five nationally uh, prior to the pandemic. And, and, and that's great. We had 72% um, uh, pushing 73% of, of uh, the people in the work uh, people in the workforce age were actually engaged in work, which is which is absolutely fantastic. And I would submit to you that the, 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 the track of the growth in our workforce participation number, uh, aligned pretty closely with, with the re business tax reductions we started in, 20, in the 2015 budget that actually began in January 1st of 2016. And these benefits come as a result of just becoming more competitive. Uh, through the three rounds of tax relief, we have now lowered our corporate profits tax below that of Massachusetts. And, and we're now better positioned regionally with our business tax environment to compete for, the, for those employers to come to New Hampshire or to have existing employers grow here. And I think that's an, an important factor to keep in mind that, that making sure that we have good jobs, particularly as we come out of a pandemic, this is gonna be critical over the long term. House Bill 10 would continue to expand that advantage with a particular focus on small businesses uh, because of the nature of the, the, the focus of this one. The first two rounds, the ones that were included in the 2015 budget really were 
emphasizing the business profits tax. Uh, the, the two rounds that were included in the, tw in the 2017 budget, which of which this bill would actually finally implement the, that for fourth round over two years, were really focused more on the business enterprise tax, which as this committee knows, truly benefits the small businesses that have uh, been ravaged so, so dramatically uh, and through, as a result of the pandemic. Uh, there's one other thing I want to point out. I know that one of the things we talk about is revenue, but it's important as we're talking about revenue to sort of look at some of the changes in the last legislature. Looking at the surplus statement that was attached with, with the last bu budget, House Bills 3 and 4 from 2019, one of the things we note is just by going through that surplus statement, ta tax law changes as a result of Senate Bill 190 and, and House Bill 4 resulted in, at least estimated at the time, 41, 41 and a quarter million dollars in tax increases on businesses. And that's, that's a result of, of, of changing things on reapportionment, reapportionment and conformity, as well as uh, taxing of glo global investment, low tax income or GILTI. Uh, now, I, I'll say the, the policy changes, the policy changes that, that took place through reapportionment, the policy changes that took place as a result of conformity, they stand up on their own. Those policy changes make sense, made sense on their own. However, as you broaden that base, it's also important to, re to reduce rates. And the way I view it, the, the changes that are included in House Bill 10 do uh, follow up to the, the tax law changes in, in the last legislature to basically get business back to even. And, that, and again, we are fully supportive of the idea of broadened base and lower rates. So with uh, that in mind, uh, we stand fully supportive of House Bill 10, and I'd be happy to take any questions from the committee. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, and Representative Nunez, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Moore, for testifying to us today. It's good to see you on a screen, even though it's just your picture. Um, uh, when we talk about economic downturns, I think that we all need could to- this be, Could this be louder, please? How's, how's that? You may want to take down your better, mask. Better, better. Is that better? You, you want me to take down my mask? Is that better? That's better. I couldn't hear before. Thank you so much. And thank you for letting me know that because I certainly want to be heard. Uh, Mr. Moore, when we talk about economic, economic downturns, um, I think sometimes that we forget that there are different there are different levels of economic downturns. Some of that is is a lack of consumer confidence. Sometimes it is bad planning by the feds, and, and sometimes it's about bad policy introduction at the state level. I think that when we compare 2020 to other years, a pandemic hit in 2020, and I don't think it's fair for us to judge in 2020 but for us to look back in the past and look at the growth that we've had from reduction in business taxes. Uh, Mr. Moore, can you touch a little bit more on the growth that we had over the past several years before the pandemic and looking at our unemployment rate and where we're going right now and the possibility for businesses to be coming open again as they are in Massachusetts and other areas that are opening up their businesses right now. I think that we'll be following suit, hopefully. Um, can you talk to the level of confidence that we'll have in our economy here in the state and why reducing this tax would help us? Well, I, at first I'd say, uh, I, I tend to look back at this as, as a, a five-year discussion, not necessarily a one-year discussion. Um, it's clear that without question what happened, what happened last year, I think we can all say that we, none of us hopes that would ever happen again or any time again in the near, near term. Uh, but there's no question that as we become more competitive, that, that gives us an opportunity to go, go and make the case to businesses in other states. And the folks, the folks over at BEA, I think, do an outstanding job of recruiting these businesses to come here. Uh, so it's a twofold part. It's, it's the, the lower taxes, particularly in the business enterprise tax side, help our existing small businesses here get back on their feet, particularly talking food service and hospitality industry. But uh, particularly the, the lowering of the business profits tax is also important, even though, even though this, this, this particular bill is focused more on the business enterprise, because it allows us to make the case to businesses outside of New Hampshire, places like Massachusetts, places like all across New England, and say, this is a place to be. This is a place that wants to do business with you and is going to be a partner with you. And we're sending a clear direction 
by saying that we are going to continue uh, a pro-growth economic policy, that, that we're gonna be on your side. And that's, I think right now, and I think particularly coming out of this pandemic, what I think a lot of employers want to hear. That's, that's exactly the message we wanna be sending. So, so I think it's critical I, and it's critical for us to keep sending these positive, positive messages to, uh, to the community, business community to say, we, we're going to be with you. We're going to, we understand that, it, that it's, you're going through some tough times. And even if, even if some businesses who haven't never neg been negatively impacted want to say, we're the place that want, wants to work with you and wants to have you come and, and be here and be part of our economy. So I think that, that the message that this sends directionally is also critical as well. Thank you very much, Mr. Moore. Thank you, Mr. Lester. One more question for you, uh, uh, Representative Hillary. Um, excuse me. One yes. more question for you, Representative Hillary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Moore, uh, the same question I asked earlier about uh, historical analysis. Uh, you and I have both attended conferences with um, uh, Dr. Laffer, who is funny, or an economist who's funny. but. <clears throat> Excuse me, but at any rate, Tom, do you have any information from AFP regarding the uh, practical effect of uh, reducing um, uh, uh, taxes and the and the increasing generation of revenue from uh, any other sources that we could uh, uh, use a study for uh, what Representative Ames uh, uh, is seeking uh, facts? Thank you. Uh, I, I have done a, a bit of a literature review on this. Uh, certainly, certainly there, there is plenty of uh, confirmatory evidence, if, if that's the case, of, of increased business activity. But I think it also depends, uh, as Representative Major pointed out in his testimony, that, uh, that, that sometimes uh, consumption is fairly stable and, and, um, and increases in reduction in some taxes will have little or no little or no Im impact on the actual level of consumption. Uh, as much as I hate to say it, the, we've seen that quite a bit with the uh, meals and rental tax, where increasing the tax rate has not resulted necessarily in a drop in consumption. Uh, whereas there are a lot of other taxes where, 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 where the economic impact is more sensitive. And I think that, that um, Certainly, certainly there, there's a, a great deal of body of research and to the extent that I can be helpful to the committee, I'd be happy to, to look up and try to identify any of that research and provide it to the committee as, as you, you deem necessary. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Moore. Appreciate your uh, testimony. Thank you. Okay, next up is uh, Drew Klein. Can we uh, open him up? Hi there, thank you. Um, if everybody can hear me, I thank you, Mr. So can Chairman. you uh, let us know who you're representing these days? Sure, yeah, so um, I'm turning up my volume a little bit here. Uh, I'm Drew Klein, I'm president of the Josiah Bartlett Center for Public Policy, the free market think tank in New Hampshire. And um, my interest in this is, testimony today is just to um, actually answer some of the questions that I've heard uh, brought up by members of the committee uh, regarding the effect of business tax rate reductions on state revenues in the past few years. So if you go back to 2015, when uh, you had the state budget debate over the tax rate reductions, uh, Governor Hassan predicted that the business ta rate, tax rate reductions would create a $90 million hole in the upcoming two-year budget. But what actually happened? Instead, business tax revenues came in 132.8 million or 23.4% above plan in fiscal year 2016, 72.7 .7 million or 12.9% above plan in fiscal year 2017. For the next budget, <clears throat> business taxes came in 118.8 million or 17.9% above plan in fiscal year 2018 and 151.6 million or 23.2% above plan in FY 2019. So you look back at those four years since the business tax rate reductions began in 2016, business tax revenues exceeded budget projections by a combined $475.6 million. So we're talking about almost half a billion dollars in new revenue, un unanticipated um, above budget projections. <clears throat> In 2017, 
The Office of Legislative Budget Assistant projected that the additional business tax rate reductions passed in 2017 would cause an $11 million reduction in business tax revenues in fiscal year 2019. Instead, business tax revenues came in 15.16 million above plan that year. I am not saying that the business tax revenues it caused all of those increases. As uh, Representative Bellamy points out, there was um, economic growth elsewhere in the country. But I would point out that GDP growth in the United States in those four years, and I just did this quick calculation um, looking at Federal Reserve data, economic growth in the US, GDP growth was 9.3% from 2016 to 2019. In New Hampshire, GDP growth was 11.6%. So it was more than 2% greater than the US average since we've been cutting these business tax rates. Um, I think the obvious takeaway is that the way, when you have this fiscal note done by the legislative budget assistant, um, that is, as they say, static. It is not dynamic. And what that means is that they do not take into account when they do this calculation, what the effects of the business tax rate changes would be on behavior. They simply look at numbers um, on a spreadsheet. And when you consider what the changes to business behavior are, you see um, that it does in fact stimulate some additional economic activity. And we know this um, not just from Art Laffer, who uh, has been brought up several times here as the godfather of um, supply side economics, but since then, there's been a tremendous amount of research from all sorts of economists on the effects of business tax rate changes. And though you will find some outlier studies, by and large, they do show that there is a, a negative effect on economic growth from high business tax rates and a positive effect on economic growth from lower business tax rates. In addition, since this bill um, does focus a little bit more on the BET, I think it's worth pointing out that that effect is particularly strong with small businesses. I would point to a 2018 study by the Federal Reserve. So just a couple years ago, they did a study looking at entrepreneurship and state taxation. <clears throat> and their conclusion was, um, and I can, I can quote from the study, we find, uh, I'll quote, we find that new firm employment is negatively and disproportionately affected by corporate tax rates, end quote. So there is a great body of literature showing that lowering business tax rates, corporate tax rates, does have a bit of a stimulative effect on the economy, can help GDP growth, and can particularly help small businesses. And since almost all businesses in New Hampshire, the large majority are small businesses, um, I think one of the takeaways you can have from lowering these rates, particularly the BET, is that it would have a positive effect on small business growth. And that's yeah. all I have. Thank you, uh, Mr. Klein. A any questions for Mr. Klein? Any hands up? Okay, seeing no hands up. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Klein. Appreciate it. Thank uh, you. Are there any other hands up? Uh, anybody else want to testify? Wants to testify? Okay, seeing none. Okay, thank you. I'm going to read the blue sheet now. All of these folks signed up are in support of the bill. Senator Hennessy, Jonathan Smith, Senator Carson, Representative Lang, uh, Representative Tony Lacus, uh, David Juve from Business BIA, uh, Lisa Post, Eric uh, representing himself, uh, Eric Retham representing himself, and Alvin C representing himself. Okay, uh, with that, I'm going to close uh, the hearing on House Bill. 10. So Mr. Vice Chair, I like that gavel. Yeah, I know. <laughs> okay, next bill is House House Bill uh, 15. And uh, we have uh, Representative Packard who stayed with us. Thank you very much, Representative Packard, for, or Speaker Packard, I should say, uh, for hanging in here with us. I just want to say for the committee, uh, this is the bill relative to including under the meals and rooms tax facilitators of internet transactions of motor vehicle rentals and facilitators of internet transactions of room uh, occup occupancies. 
I, I just want to point out to the committee, those new nine members, this is a bill that we worked on very hard last year uh, and that uh, for whatever reason didn't make it through the Senate. Uh, but I, I think, uh, uh, and we merged, Representative uh, had a, he was a sponsor of the, uh, last year was a sponsor of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the not the room of meals, but the, the auto, uh, the motor vehicle rentals piece of this. We merged the two bills last year into one. But with that, I will turn it over to Speaker um, Packer. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Actually, this is the third session we've had this because remember in the first session, it was the Wayfarer decision we were waiting for. Right, exactly. And then we went into the second session and last uh, last year, because of the pandemic, it got thrown into the mix and it, I think it was one of those 30 or 40 bills the Senate put together and- um, And that one didn't make that, it. That one didn't make it through. Right. So this is third try. Um, first of all, I want to, I, uh, some people have said that this is a tax, a new tax or a tax increase. Uh, I want to make sure everyone understands it is not. I think it was about 15 years ago, uh, the legislature voted to include um, motor vehicle rentals into the rooms and meals tax. Can't remember exactly how many years. Since then, we've had a new type of um, rental company come into existence. Um, they have people, it's, it's, I think it's based somewhat on the same thing as Uber is, where people use their personal cars. Only this one, the people rent their personal cars uh, through different companies. And one of the bigger ones that we run into is a company called Choro out of California. They're the facilitator of the rental. And let's say Representative Doucette has an extra car sitting in his yard and he wants to rent it. Well, he can rent that car through Toro and then he gets a percentage of the money. So what we discovered, and it was brought to our attention by the rental car companies, is that if we're going to charge the rental car companies the 9%, then anybody renting a car should be charged the 9%. Pretty simple. That's why I, I, am, I am insistent that this is not a new tax. This is something that's fair. If you want to get rid of the 9% in the rental car companies, go for it. I'm all for it. But if you're going to keep the 9% on the rental car companies, then I think any company renting a car should have to pay the 9%. That's pretty much what this, uh, the, what this bill does. Uh, I'll let you address, Mr. Chairman, the other part on the uh, Airbnb part because obviously that was a thing that you instituted, you know, into this bill, there were two bills and I understand that. So that's all this bill does is it makes it a plain, a fair playing field. Is that if one company is gonna be charged 9% and this company is over here, it's a different model, they do it differently, but it's still a rental car company. So, all I'm asking is that um, we move forward with this bill and make it fair for those rental car companies out there. Okay, uh, we just discovered that I'm also a sponsor on the bill, so I, I shouldn't be chairing this. So we're gonna ask Alan Bernstein to, to uh, this is for the committee. Well, uh, actually, Mr. Chairman, you can chair as long as you don't get into any discussion or ask any questions. Oh, okay. Thank so, you. so yeah. you can uh, say that as long as you don't testify and you don't ask questions. All right. Can, or, uh, or I could chair. <laughs> is a member uh, is a, a member of the committee, whether present here, who was here last year, or on, on, uh, want to explain the Airbnb? But we, call, we used to call it the Airbnb bill. Uh, does someone want to just add a little light on that for for the rest of the members? Representative Almay will. Okay, Rep Representative Almay is recognized. Thank you. Um, last year, we we had been dealing, the DRA had been dealing for quite some time with this issue with hotel lodgings. Um, the hotel lodging companies that arranged on the internet for, um, they would buy up large quantities of hotel rooms in, in New Hampshire, for instance, 
and then offer them at lower prices than what they would be, be offered at by the hotel itself. And it did that because it was not paying the 9%. It declared that the 9% was a commission that had nothing to do with the regular cost. And um, the DRA can probably correct me on this if, if they want to, but on, and the DRA finally managed to reach an agreement with Airbnb that they would pay the 9%, but that left all the smaller companies that were doing this and it left Airbnb at a disadvantage with those companies. So um, the, it was brought, there was a lawsuit, which the DRA can tell you more about. There was a lawsuit um, by some of those companies saying, we don't have to pay this. And it went to our Supreme Court and our Supreme Court, New Hampshire said, uh, you're right under the law, the way it is now, you can't, you don't have to pay this. But if they just change this piece, Yes, you're, you should be paying this. And so that's why that bill came in. It was sponsored by Representative Butler, who uh, did not run again this term, who runs a small BNB, &B, which was being discriminated against by this also. Um, and um, that bill also was something that we were going to put through very easily. There was no opposition to it. Um, developing it all. And uh, we got hit by the, uh, the Senate's omnibus requirements. And we put those together largely because they're, they are doing exactly the same thing from two different segments of industry uh, to exactly the same sections of the statute. And we wanted to make sure that it was consistent. So that's why that piece of this is in here. And um, it seems to, it, there may be a company or two still trying to avoid being taxed for the same thing Airbnb is paying and, and all of our brick and mortar hotels and B&Bs are paying. Um, but um, we heard very little, if any, opposition. If, if I may add too that um, the one of the other discrepancies here in which we didn't take into effect because it, it doesn't affect the state is the airport uh, also charges uh, the rental car companies a 10% fee on and the state charges the 9%. So, uh, you know, some of the rental car companies, Hertz, Davis, Enterprise, were paying when they rented a car at the airport an extra 20%. And uh, these uh, companies that were doing renting the cars privately would still deliver the cars to the airport, have park them in the parking lot, have somebody pick the car up, they would have a code, they would pick the car up, bring it back to the airport and not pay in the airport 10% fee. Now that's a different, and uh, quite a few of the airports in the country got a hold of this and have made changes. We haven't touched the airport part. This is strictly the state part, but uh, you can see how unfair it is. I mean, if, if we want a fair playing field for our businesses and these brick and mortar businesses uh, contribute a lot, I think the um, uh, manager of the uh, enterprise is going to also be on the, uh, and tell you how many people they employ and how many how many dollars they contribute to the economy of the state of New Hampshire. So all we're asking is fair playing field. That's all this bill does. Um, again, if you want me to get rid of the 9%, it wouldn't bother me a bit. But assuming that we're going to keep the 9%, uh, I ask that um, you uh, consider this bill. I know it passed out of committee last session on a unanimous vote. And uh, hopefully we'll get the same unanimous vote and we can give a little bit of fairness to uh, those people that are working and everything else in the state of New uh, any, other, any other questions for the speaker? Uh, Representative Schomburg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative, for the presentation. Uh, I guess my question comes down to this. Do uh, our New Hampshire entrepreneurial individuals who remain as individuals seeking to improve their financial status, 
have to worry about being classified as a company from now on for the use of the internet to spread that their own entrepreneurial spirit? Uh, no, 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 Representative. Uh, and that was all taken. That, that's why this bill sat in this committee last year for two, two years almost before it was passed out of committee. So DRA can work on all the partic uh, particulars of it. And if I'm correct, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, they said that the individual would not be, and you could correct me, Mr. Chairman, if I'm wrong, because I know you worked on this extensively, the individual would not be the one that would be paying it. It would be the company itself that actually collects the money. Correct. And it's in the same the same uh, way that Airbnb, if I'm correct, the company collects the money and then, you know, turns a percentage over to, you know, the person that owns the small house or whatever. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Could, could I just add something to that? Yes, sir. Thank you. I'm sorry to be out of line. On um, the, the individual under our current law, the individuals are responsible for renting that car. The individuals are responsible for renting that home whole, uh, uh, hotel room. If they do not pay and the, and the hotel or the online company does not pay, then the DRA can and has sometimes, I believe, they can talk to you about it, go after the individual who had no idea he had a tax to be levied and make them pay. I, 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 I yeah, I, I think you know, Representative Almy is right, but um, the, uh, the, thing I'm, the thing I'm saying is that these people that are renting their private vehicles uh, really don't have a platform unless, you know, when something, some of the things were brought up as well, my neighbor, takes my vehicle to go pick up a refrigerator or something, they're going to have to pay the 9%. Well, that's just crazy. That's just ludicrous. This is the people that sign up with these companies like Toro and a few others out there. So they're already in the system and their cars get rented through Toro or the other company. So it's not like you're going to have anybody out there. And if somebody out there can successfully individually just rent their vehicle somehow, then I'm, I, I realistically don't think that, uh, you know, he we catch. after somebody renting a vehicle a couple of times a year. But this is the company itself. The amount of money right now is small, but remember Uber first started, the amount of people using Uber was small, and then it got bigger and bigger. So if we're gonna have a fair playing field, then this is, I think, the way we go. Otherwise, make a change in the taxes. Uh, can I just interject, uh, Representative Almy, if you refer to uh, the second page of the bill, lines 13 through 18, I think this is addressed that you can't go after the person that owns the room or the vehicle. I think I think we covered that last year, so it's in the bill. Yeah, it, it was brought up last year. Right? Yeah, I yeah. Think, yeah. Yep, yeah, I think you're protected. That was brought up, and I talked about it. Okay. Very good. And it, it's it's in the bill, but it's in the bill with the basis that that somebody else is going to pay it, namely the the online company that has been providing the insurance, that has been providing uh, cleaning and all sorts of things like that. Okay, we'll have a discussion when we when we meet in uh, and we'll be meeting on this bill as a as a committee. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Okay, thank, thank you. you. I do have one. Dennis has oh, a I'm part. sorry. I'm sorry. We have one more. <laughs> Representative Malloy, Ms. Lindsay. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for uh, recognizing me, and, and uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, for taking my question. Uh, and this is really for the benefit of the whole committee. I'm hopeful that would you agree that uh, the work that we did on this bill uh, last session was thorough and complete, and it's really. We put a lot of effort into this to make this right. Uh, I would agree 100% representative, and that's why it, it took this, you know, the two years to do it. And I believe you came out with a damn good product. So hopefully we can move it forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you both. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Okay, so we have uh, seven seven others that want to testify. So 
if we can all be, because we're way behind now, um, if we could try to keep it to three minutes each, that'd be great. Uh, I, I really appreciate it. Uh, I won't cut you off uh, if you go a few a minute or so over, but we got to kind of keep it down to a dull roar here so we can, we can get through this. So uh, we'll start with uh, Clarissa Alexis. Uh, she represents Enterprise Holdings. Are you still there? Is, I thought I put her in. There we go. I think I'm unmuted now. And uh, uh, Miss uh, Alexis, can you also touch why, since you're Enterprise, I'm assuming that's Enterprise Car Rental. Uh, can you touch on the uh, on the uh, airport issue, please? Yes, would uh, I can definitely touch on that as part of. Uh, Part of what I wanted to share today and, and really just starting off, I wanted to say good afternoon, Chairman Major, Vice Chair Brahmi, members of the committee. It's great to see so many familiar faces. I, I know many of you were part of this unanimous vote to pass the legislation last session. Um, for those of you that I don't know, my name is Krissa Alexis. I'm a New Hampshire resident. I live in Wyndham. Um, my office is based out of Londonderry and I'm also an employer of nearly 400 residents with over 30 locations across the state. Um, as the regional vice president overseeing enterprise holdings operations in New Hampshire. And as of the last time we were discussing this bill, uh, we were proud to have contributed over $8 million in state tax revenues. We spent over 7 million with local New Hampshire businesses in the auto industry and donated more than $46,000 to charitable organizations in our great state. So needless to say, but I will, we're heavily invested in New Hampshire uh, to the continued prosperity of the families we employ and to our communities. So my involvement began um, in this bill began because enterprise supports a very simple principle, which is equal rules of the road for all rental car transactions. And I think Speaker Packard represented that perfectly. We are not looking to create new taxes. Um, what we do know is the way rental car transactions are conducted has changed and evolved since the original tax rules were written. And we're looking to expand the platforms that are covered to create a level playing field for everyone renting a car. Um, Enterprise, we've been exploring an opportunity to offer peer-to-peer -peer car rentals as well. Um, and we want to play by the rules when we do so, making sure we're paying taxes, following consumer protection, safety and privacy laws, that go along with making vehicles available for rent to our public. Because some peer-to-peer -peer companies claim that these laws don't apply to them, everyone needs clarities on the rule of the road. Uh, when we rolled up our sleeves and really started digging into this legislation back in 2019, uh, the opponents argued the language, definitions, and premise of the bill. They tried to create fear about what would happen if the online platforms were to be taxed the way they should be. Um, they kept offering to work together to come up with agreeable language that would address all of their concerns. But after two years of working on this um, and the oppo opposition being given a working platform and open discussion to make recommendations, they just didn't. They kept waning about how it wouldn't work, but didn't really give us anything to work with. Um, also in those two years, many other states have passed similar legislation and it has not stifled the growth of the platforms or any new online rental car uh, initiatives. Um, I agree with Representative Malloy. Our representative worked really hard to create a bill that was fair and works here in New Hampshire. Representative Almy did a great job leading the discussions that got us the bill to a place everyone agreed on. Um, and when we passed this through the committee last year, the DRA agreed this bill was easily applied and enforceable. Um, so at the end of the day, to me, uh, this bill is about fairness and we should not let some peer-to-peer -peer companies dodge taxes. Just as many states have already decided in other gig economy debates, we're simply asking for equal rules of the road for everyone in the car rental space. Um, competition is good and healthy and welcome. Uh, we just want a fair shot at winning every rental we can, and we believe in an even playing field for all rental car providers um, is necessary to keep a healthy market and industry. Um, I believe there was a request for me to comment on the airport market. And here in New Hampshire, we work very closely um, with both uh, MHT and PSM. And I know um, Ted and the team over at MHT, um, this is very topical for them. And you know he's had other legislation that he's brought to the table, um, but we have had the support of our airport directors here as well to create an even playing field when it comes to rental uh, car transactions and facilitators. 
I don't know if that answered the question, but I'm absolutely um, open to and welcome to any other questions the committee may have. Okay, thank you. Uh, other questions? Are there any uh, hands up, please? Uh, Representative Almey. Representative Almey, please. Representative Almey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, could you give us uh, a list of the other states that have passed similar legislation now? Because last time we did this, I think we were the only holdout and there were some other states considering things. Uh, correct. So we, I do have a list and um, maybe I will email that over to you guys because um, I need to pull it up. But I do know when we were talking last session, um, there was legislation that was passed in the state of Maine. They split the tax and the insurance apart. I know the insurance doesn't apply here, but the tax bill that they put through was very much in line um, with what we were looking to do in New Hampshire. I think our New Hampshire bill though, works good with what legislation and tax rules we already have in place in the state. Um, so I can send you a list um, that I have. I'll email that over to the committee. Thank you. We look forward to seeing that. Um, any other questions for uh, Ms. Alexis? Okay, thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Okay, next up is uh, Stephen Schur uh, from the Travel Technology Association who opposes the bill. Can we open him up? Yep, I gave him permission. Good afternoon, members of the committee. Are you all able to hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Steve Scher. I'm the president of the Travel Technology Association. I represent companies like Expedia and Priceline and Verbo, uh, all of whom uh, inspire and facilitate travel bookings uh, in the state of New Hampshire. Um, but before I get into the testimony that I prepared today, I wanted to just um, take a moment and reflect on um, the speaker's introduction to the legislation. And if this bill is really about car sharing, then I believe that um, there's a way to draft the legislation that, that narrowly addresses the car sharing issue. That's not my issue uh, here today. My concern with the legislation is that it, uh, it applies the meals and rooms tax to travel agent fees. And I can explain that. And that would apply to not only car rentals for people who book uh, car rentals through platforms like Expedia and Priceline, but also hotels uh, and short-term rentals. Think of it this way. Online travel agents like those companies operate much like brick and mortar travel agents. They facilitate the booking. They, they don't have possession of the vehicles or the rooms, uh, simply providing a service. And what this bill would do would, is, would apply the meals and rooms tax to that new service fee. And it would apply to New Hampshire travel agents as well. So when you book a room or a car or a short-term rental on one of those platforms, typically what happens is that platform collects the room rate or the car rental rate and all the applicable taxes and passes those on to the hotel or to the car rental company for remittance to the local jurisdiction or the state. And then they also charge the traveler a small travel agent service fee. That service fee will be subject to this new tax. And that's why in my testimony that I, that I provided in my written letter to the committee, as well as uh, the written testimony of the American Society of Travel Advisors, we're concerned that the broad nature of the use of this tax uh, that would apply to hotel bookings through third party and travel agents, as well as car rentals, um, would be detrimental to the state. As you're all aware, the pandemic has had a dramatic impact on the travel and tourism industry. That's no secret to anyone. And we just firmly believe at this point that now is not the time to tax any aspect of travel and tourism uh, and rather look ahead towards recovery. We think this tax will have a negative effect on the recovery in that it will make accommodations more expensive. And even for New Hampshire citizens, our research shows that about 25% of hotel rooms booked on online travel sites are in-state bookings. And given the pandemic and travel restrictions, et cetera, we're seeing actually higher rates of in-state travel. And so uh, like all taxes, this will be passed on to the consumer in the form of higher room rates, higher car rental rates, as those taxes are uh, recalculated into the total cost of the trip. 
And so I would urge you, if the true goal of this legislation is to narrow the focus uh, to car sharing, then do so. Uh, but the way it's drafted now would unnecessarily tax travel agents and online travel agents uh, for everything from hotel, hotel bookings to car rental companies. And I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. I appreciate your time. Mr. Sure. Did you, uh, you, you said you sent something, you have sent something to us? Okay. Yes, I did. I sent a uh, letter to the entire committee. We'll take a look at that. Uh, I, I know we had this discussion last year and here before. Uh, uh, well, let us take a look at that. Um, thanks for bringing it to our attention. Um, Thank any you. Any questions for Mr. Shore? Representative Almey does. Representative Almey. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Shore, uh, I'm sure you heard the previous speaker on, she said that uh, they'd asked for information from you and in how to, um, word things so that it would avoid, I presume this issue, which I don't remember, frankly, on, um, do you have such language at this point to share with the committee? Uh, I certainly could provide that to me. Other states have, have as was mentioned previously, have, have done something similar. And again, if, if the goal is to address ride sharing, car, I'm sorry, car sharing, not ride sharing, um, in this context, that, that there is a way to draft the legislation that doesn't involve traditional car rental bookings on platforms like Expedia and Priceline, as well as hotel room bookings on those same platforms. So I'd be happy to follow up with you and the members of the committee on that. Thank you. You realize we don't have a lot of time, so we'd need it by next week. Certainly, I'd be happy to provide that in that time frame. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sure. Any other questions, any other hands up? No. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sure. Okay, next up is, uh, uh, Henry Bellew um, uh, from the New Hampshire Lodging and Restaurant Association uh, in support of the bill. Um, I'm trying to find him. He didn't come up in my, I think he may have left. I saw him here, here earlier, but now I can't find him. You don't see him either? Okay, why don't we, uh, we'll move on then. Henry, if you're out there, let us know. <laughs> but, okay. Um, okay, uh, next up would be uh, Carl Zebo, Zebo of uh, Net Choice in opposition to the bill. Yeah. Oh, yes, committee members, can you hear me please? Yes, uh, we can. Excellent. My name is Carl Zabo. I am vice president and general counsel of NetChoice. And I do wanna thank you all for letting me speak here today. Just to be clear, I have been fighting for the past decade vehemently to help protect New Hampshire from out of state overreach with respect to online sales taxes. I fought, uh, NetChoice was the first group to bring suit against the state of South Dakota when they tried to institute their legislation. I filed an amicus brief at the US Supreme Court. I've spoken with many of you on panels and stood by, by you as we defend the rights of New Hampshire residents to avoid unlawful taxation from other states. And one thing I noticed that I found rather jarring to me today was hearing much of the same rhetoric that I fought so hard against when it came to online sales taxation, when it comes to hotel lodging services taxation and car rental services taxation. And it was the level playing field, unfairness. These were terms I heard time and time again for the past decade coming from Rila and other brick and mortar stores as they said, it's unfair and we need to level the playing field that New Hampshire businesses aren't paying their fair share of taxes. So once again, it was very surprising and, and uh, frustrating for me to hear those types of phrases from my colleagues and, and uh, the representatives in New Hampshire. Now, speaking to the merits of this legislation, I did submit testimony. Uh, I oppose both components of it. With respect to the hotel tax, as well as the new tax on car rental. Now it is 
important to be clear that this is a new tax. This is a new tax on services. Currently, there are only three states in the union that tax services. New Hampshire, thankfully, is not one of them. But when we're talking about the services being provided here, this is not where the tax is being applied. The amount of money that it costs to actually rent a room in a hotel is being fully taxed today. What we're talking about is applying a new tax to any additional services provided by travel agencies, whether it's the service fee they charge to basically make a living called their service fee, whether it's a new tax on part of a bundled provision. So you would still get the occupancy tax on a hotel room, but if we combine that now with lift tickets or transportation to ski slopes, that's now being taxed at the occupancy rate. That's the effort that's being sought here and it's being pushed by big hotels. And why do they wanna push this? Because they don't want you using small travel agents. They don't want you using online travel agent websites. They want you going directly to Marriott.com and not finding those boutique hotels who can't otherwise break out. On the car sharing side, you heard from Hertz. Well, we just want a fair playing field, level playing field, fairness. The number of cars that Turo owns today in the state of New Hampshire is zero. The number of car rental locations they have at the airports is zero. Essentially what we're talking about is applying a new tax to the basic action when a neighbor says, can I borrow your truck? Now I do appreciate the fact that you did include in subsection seven exemption that you can't go after the individuals of your state for the collection of these taxes. However, with the broad definition included in the legislation of the terms of rental uh, service, it could easily be applied to New Hampshire residents. And the term I was referring to is rental facilitator, so broadly written that if I were the Department of Taxation, I could easily make that apply to New Hampshire citizens. I would ask that you not advance this bill. I do appreciate the fact that it has been worked on for three years, but that doesn't necessarily make it a bill worthy of moving forward. To answer uh, Representative Almy's question about do we have recommended language, I did include in my testimony two possibilities of recommended language with respect to the uh, hotel occupancy tax agent component. And they both come as models from Alec, who has repeatedly stood against these forms of new taxes. I'm, I was trying to be fast and I covered a lot, so I welcome any questions you ha may have. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Uh, are there any hands up? Uh, not in the room, any, uh, uh, any hands up? I have a question. Okay, yeah. yes, Representative. I'm wondering um, what types of taxes um, online uh, businesses like yours or the ones you represent pay and in what states and how do you do, how, how is it decided what state it's paid to? That was, that was Representative Kamala, by the way. Yes, thank, thank you, Representative, excellent question. So just to be clear, the uh, taxes are always paid. So let's use the example of hotels. If I were to go and use a travel agent to book a hotel in New Hampshire, that hotel, and let's presume the cost of the hotel is $80, for the room, 100% of the hotel occupancy tax on that $80 is paid. That's now, if my travel agent here in Maryland charged me five additional dollars for a total of, it would be $88 for the room because that includes the occupancy tax plus five and they bundle that all together. The $5 tax for that service, since they are not a resident of New Hampshire would not be paid by New Hampshire. Now, a lot of people, especially those outside of the great state of New Hampshire, have tried to make it seem as though the Wayfair decision has let loose the tax collectors from every foreign state. That is not the case. That decision is narrowly tailored to sales tax. And what we are talking about are issues well outside the area of sales tax. We are talking essentially about business service taxes. And I can promise you, you do not want in New Hampshire, other states reaching across their borders and trying to apply their business service or business activity taxes to New Hampshire businesses, because that's essentially what we're talking about here. I'm not sure thank you. Any other questions? Any other hands up? Okay, thank you, Mr. Zebo. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll take a look at your written testimony as well. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, next up is uh, John Olson, who is with the uh, Internet Association in the opposition of the bill. And uh, for the committee, I'm gonna step away for a second and Representative Major is gonna take over. Thank you. So, uh, so, uh, so uh, Mr. Olson. He's there. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair and members of the committee. My name is John Olson. I'm the Regional Director for the Internet Association representing the Northeast. Um, I represent most of the companies uh, this tax would apply to with respect to Expedia, Airbnb, and Turo. Um, I will refrain from repeating my written testimony I submitted last night, so you should have had time to look at it. I would just say from my perspective, uh, representing the internet industry, um, you know, this is a very unique time. We are still under the throes of a pandemic and experiencing economic recovery across the states. Uh, and I don't think that's any less true in New Hampshire. Uh, generally, the services that um, this rooms and meals tax would be applied to have become uh, almost a lifeline to New Hampshire residents. In general, I think the car sharing aspect has allowed most new uh, New Hampshire residents that utilize Turo and other car sharing platforms to uh, help offset uh, a significant liability in the form of their vehicle. Um, I think the same can be said for renting out rooms or second homes through travel platforms such as the RBO, HomeAway, or Airbnb. Uh, in general, as Carl mentioned previously, this is a new tax and it's likely a tax that will either directly be impacting New Hampshire residents or, you know, pass the cost along to them for using these platforms. Uh, so I would just ask the committee uh, to consider, you know, the current environment is this the right time to, uh, to assess new fees and taxes on New Hampshire residents? And is it really a wise decision to use uh, the platforms as a means of generating revenue when they've become almost the exclusive ability for uh, folks in, the in New Hampshire and other states from, uh, from making a living or earning supplemental income? And I welcome any questions related to that or my written testimony. Thank you. We have a question from uh, Representative Allen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Olson, did you, um, do you have any idea how many, much business Turo does in this state yet? Because when we discussed this last year, as I recall, there wasn't, there, he could, wasn't sure we, he had any customers at all in New Hampshire. Um, uh, they were just trying to make sure we didn't set a precedent, which apparently I, has been set. I, I don't believe that's correct. I think the number from at least last year was around 4,000 residents utilizing the platform. I can only imagine it's grown. Um, you know, I think you find that cars have become pretty expensive and almost useless piece of, of property for some people, but, you know, there are others who like to travel and find it the most affordable means of obtaining uh, a car that they may not otherwise have. So I don't think it's correct to say there are no customers in, in New Hampshire. And I imagine there may be someone from Turo testifying today. If not, um, that information can readily be um, given to you. But in general, I would say New Hampshire does have many people using Turo and, and using it to uh, to supplement their income in some respects. Thank you. Any further questions? I don't see any hands raised. So then, thank you, Mr. Olson. Thank you. We're going to go to Maura Weston, who's a lobbyist for Turo. Maura. I don't believe she's on. I haven't seen her name yet. Raise your hand if you're Mara Weston. Looks like she might be MMW. All right, then we will go to, there's two people from the DRA. Are they both going to testify? Wait a minute. Carolyn Lear and Devin. I, I believe we do have Mara Weston. Yeah, she just came on. 
Okay. Yes, Maura is on. I'm sorry, my computer is labeled MMW. I apologize for that. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Wonderful. Thank you. Good afternoon. I appreciate this opportunity to testify today. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Maura Weston, and I am testifying today on behalf of Turo, which is an internet-based peer-to-peer car sharing platform. Um, I submitted written testimony for the record last evening, so you should have that for your review. We testify today in opposition to HB 15. However, I want to stress that my client and I are willing to work with the committee on developing a fair way to address peer-to-peer -peer car sharing as a unique business model without creating overly burdensome barriers to entry. Turo is an internet platform that provides a service, a service so that car owner hosts can list their vehicles for sharing with guests in need of a vehicle. Turo's peer-to-peer -peer car sharing marketplace enables New Hampshire citizens to share their personal car with neighbors or members of their community. This marketplace, as I said, provides a service. It's an economic opportunity for New Hampshire car owners to earn a small amount of extra income. It also provides drivers in search of mobility options or a specific type of vehicle, a solution. When you think about the implications of this bill, think about the New Hampshire citizen who's the host. Think about perhaps the college student who may only need to use a car two days a week for his or her internship and wants to offset a bit of their debt. Or think about the family who's cleaning out their basement and may perhaps like to share a pickup truck for a day, but otherwise couldn't afford one. Or think about the retiree on fixed income who doesn't need to use their car every day of the week and could use a small bit of extra money to help make ends meet. Peer-to-peer -peer car sharing can also be a great resource in rural areas where access to public transportation simply does not exist. Neither Turo nor our host are car rental companies. Neither should be taxed or regulated as one. <clears throat> To be clear, Turo owns no vehicles. There is no fleet. The vehicles that are shared are owned by individual New Hampshire citizens. We do oppose House Bill 15 because we believe it does in fact create a new tax on New Hampshire citizens who choose to share their car. This is akin to taxing a family's neighborhood lemonade stand as if they were Minute Maid. Currently, to answer Representative Almy's uh, question, there are about 400 Turo hosts in New Hampshire, and those average host earnings per month are around $300. We are talking about just a small amount of extra income for people who are looking to offset debt or make ends meet. In addition to imposing this new tax, the bill and relevant regulations would require any operator or host to register with the Department of Revenue and provide the name and place of their business within the state. I believe those licenses also have to be posted. The taxation and regulation imposed by this bill is government interference with the use of personal property. For all practical purposes, this bill would shut down the opportunity for peer-to-peer -peer car sharing in New Hampshire. If New Hampshire wants to address peer-to-peer -peer car sharing, we suggest consideration of the 2019 NCOIL model bill. The NCOIL model provides a regulatory framework for peer-to-peer -peer car sharing. Many states, I believe approximately 14, um, currently have peer-to-peer -peer car sharing laws on the books. There is significant precedence for treating peer-to-peer -peer car sharing as distinct and different from car rental companies. Uh, the NCOIL model does that. There is a background from the US Department of Transportation that distinguishes those two industries. And we would encourage you to look at that and follow that lead. So today we respectfully oppose House Bill 15, the new tax it would impose on New Hampshire citizens, but we would be happy to continue to work with you on alternative approaches. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Take questions. Certainly. 
Did you, I'm sorry, did you call on me, Mr. Speaker, or Mr. Chairman? Well, I call on Representative Emanuel. Okay. Okay. Sorry, you're, sorry, Chairman, you're, you're just, you're a little fuzzy, you're hard to hear, um, but thank you. Um, Ms. Weston, thank you so much for your testimony. I'm just gonna be really honest. I've been in the hospitality industry for over 25 years and I'm actually a customer of Turo. I'm having difficulty with your testimony just because Turo is known as the Airbnb of cars. And the fact that you both have a very similar business model of not owning a fleet, not owning, and then Airbnb doesn't own any hotel rooms or any rooms. You're both providing services. Um, I stay at Airbnbs when I travel and I use Turo. So I'm very familiar with both services. Airbnb pays taxes. Um, they pay into the meals and rentals tax. So my question to you is why do you think Airbnb should, but Turo shouldn't? Can you continue to hear me? I believe I believe yeah. that Airbnb uh, entered into an agreement with the Department of Revenue on their own accord. And in fact, this bill um, <clears throat> would extend to entities similar to Airbnb and other platforms. Um, so we oppose the bill and we do distinguish um, our service from Airbnb and Airbnbs made their own business decisions um, and um, I can't speak for them, but uh, we have a very different position. Okay, thank you. Representative Dennis Malloy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you for taking my question. Um, and I, 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 I apologize if this comes across as, um, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm trying to be very delicate here. Uh, in the, committee work that we did on this bill last term, if I'm not mistaken, we were presented with printed material, advertising material that said, um, Truro is a car rental company. It said that on this. Now, I might be mistaken. I might be not uh, remembering quite clearly enough, but in your testimony, you said Truro, uh, you, are not, you are not a car rental company. So I would ask you to if you would please uh, rec uh, reconcile those statements if they need reconciliation. Thank you very much. Sure, sure. I'm, ha I'm happy to do my best. I recall that Representative Packard held up some materials last session that used the word rental. And, uh, and you know, there aren't too many ways to describe uh, the sharing of something or the use of something for consideration. Um, so if the term rental is used on the Turo website, it is, it's because a host is looking to share its car for consideration. Um, that's the colloquial word would be rent. Um, that doesn't make Turo itself a car rental company. We don't have a fleet, we don't own cars, we don't rent the cars. We provide a service to our host. Does that help? Thank you very much. I'm, Thank you. We'll, we'll work on this in committee. Sure, I'm delighted to work with you. Representative Romano. Um, my question is, what taxes does Turo pay now and to whom? Um, I will have to get back to you on that. Turo has no economic nexus to the state of New Hampshire. It's a California based entity. So I, and I'm, an, I'm a New Hampshire native, I'm here on the ground representing them. So I can't answer that question, but I can um, find out and I can get back to you. Thank you. Sure enough. Uh, Representative Yuri. Thank you uh, for your testimony. Uh, you said that Turo is a California based company. Do they pay, uh, while you're doing your research, could you find out if they pay any taxes 
in California and just let us know yes, what the status is? Certainly, certainly. Any further questions? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. All right, uh, we have two people from the DRA, Devin and Carolyn. Do you both want to speak or is there one? Does the does DRA one? Hello, Mr. Chair, Carolyn Lear, Assistant Commissioner at the Department of Revenue. I apologize, I couldn't answer your question because I wasn't yet unmuted. Um, very happy to just quickly uh, talk to you about House Bill 15. Um, as you all know, um, we've been talking about this issue with you for a while. Um, since the creation of room sharing and car sharing platforms really every state in the US has been dealing with the issue of the application of their rooms and meals or other taxes to these platform facilitated transactions. And particularly, which party, the platform or the property owner is obligated and to collect, obligated to collect and remit the MNR tax um, to the state. And additionally, whether the tax applies to the entire price paid by the consumer, um, as is currently stated in the New Hampshire MNR statute. Litigation over this issue has occurred in every single state, um, and New Hampshire was one of the last states to receive a decision from our state Supreme Court in the Priceline case, which was decided about three years ago, where New Hampshire lost that case. It was a really, it was really an instance where the um, the the pace of technology and um, businesses changing how they operate wasn't kept up with by the statute. Um, the proposed legislation would require room and car rental facilitators to collect and remit the MNR tax for the transactions they facilitate, and clarifies that the tax applies to the full price or consideration paid by the consumer. Um, these transactions facilitated by these third party platforms have always been taxable in New Hampshire. This bill simply clarifies that it's the platform that's liable for um, collecting and remitting this tax. I think this is important and uh, Speaker Packard talked about this in his testimony that these transactions have always been taxable. Um, the question has just been, is it the platform or the property owner that must collect and remit? We think that the proposed legislation will improve compliance um, because the obligation of collecting and remitting will fall to the small number of platforms instead of the tens of thousands of property owners um, in New Hampshire that are currently using these platforms. And generally these platforms are the party that also receives the money um, including the tax from the consumer. So it seems only appropriate that they should be the party um, submitting the tax to the state. Um, so we think that the proposed legislation could result in an increase in revenue due to better compliance um, and overall will serve to help us more efficiently and effectively administer the tax. No. I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs> I forgot I didn't have my on button on. <laughs> Sorry. Carolyn, could you provide what uh, the testimony you just said in writing to the committee? Absolutely. Thank you. Questions from the committee? Mr. Chairman, I've got my hand up. Representative Al. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we had a couple of assertions that I think uh, are not in our law. One of them was that if this passes the individual, uh, what Turo calls hosts that, um, that provide their cars to be rented out, 
on would have to set up as taxpayers under your system? No, I don't think that's true. Um, I think the, the goal of this legislation, as I understand it, is to actually prevent these, op these uh, car owners from having to individually become licensed. Instead, um, it imposes that obligation on the platform itself. So instead of having, um, you know, 10,000 operators licensed, you just have one operator who's licensed and remitting the tax on behalf of the many. Thank you. And if I could, another um, assertion was that the, um, oh dear, which one was it? I should have written all of these down in a separate place as we went along. Um, so that on um, what they're being charged agency fees, which a hotel, et cetera, I wouldn't pay. Um, when we charge the rooms and meals tax, do we separate out the, their cost of advertising and, and um, booking and things? Representative Almi, I think that's a really great question. Um, so normally when you buy a, a room from a hotel, all of the hotel's costs are sort of baked into that one price that you pay. And the m &R tax applies to that full price. And certainly some portion of that is attributable to the advertising costs of that hotel. Um, I think that's the logic behind including these service fees in the tax base for the m &R tax. The idea being that separating out charges isn't um, a way to sort of shave away the underlying tax base. Thank you, but could you also say whether um, if you're renting a room at the Mount Washington and they include three days of skiing, we charge a tax on the three days of skiing? Also a great question. The answer to that would be no. Um, the statute and rules provide that um, really all that's taxable are charges that are commonly associated with a room or a car rental. Um, so for example, if your, your room rental has a separate cleaning fee, that would be something that would be commonly associated with a room rental and the tax would be applied to it. But if you, for example, make long distance phone calls from your room, and there's a separately stated charge for those long distance phone calls, the m and tax wouldn't apply to that because that's not commonly associated with a hotel stay. Thank you. Can you put those answers also in what you send us? Sure. Thank you. Representative Virginia. Um, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my question would be that uh, the discussion that was about whether individuals would potentially pay or the uh, sharing app, um, individuals, my understanding of the business, of the proprietorship, let's say proprietorship business profits tax, um, you would, isn't the threshold $50,000 so that if an individual is making about $300 a week, as was suggested, that wouldn't even get anywhere near the threshold for, for um, filing a BPT proprietorship BPT, and therefore there'd be no tax on the individual. Is that correct? That's correct for business profits tax purposes. So you're right, you know, someone who's renting their car occasionally is never gonna trip the threshold for becoming a business tax taxpayer. Um, however, there is no threshold for the m and tax. So there's no sort of de minimis threshold where if you engage in transactions under a certain amount, your transactions aren't subject to tax. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Seeing none. We are on the blue sheet. We have Terry Roy signed up in opposition. Christopher Delroom, representing TechNet, opposes. And Eric Rothburn, member of the public, 
supports the bill. Anybody else want to testify for or against the bill? Not, and I'm closing the public hearing on House Bill 15. Finally, thank you. That happens sometimes, doesn't it? <laughs> You know, Mr. Chairman, when you gave up your seat, we got behind schedule. Okay. <laughs> oh, <I'm not> <laughs> <laughs> okay, I want to open the public hearing on House Bill 281-FN, an act relative to the tax expenditure report and relative to delaying the enactment of the single sales factor under the business profits and business enterprise tax. The prime sponsor, Representative Bromley, is going to introduce the bill. Representative Bromley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we're leaving the best for last, I would say, and uh, the most complicated for last. I'm the only speaker on this other than the DRA, so just bear with me here. Uh, I want to try to use this as a moment for the new members to try to understand uh, market-based sourcing and single sales factor if we can. Uh, and then we'll have more discussions and work sessions on this. Uh, but I'm here to introduce, uh, first off, for the record of the State Rep. Pat Abrami, Rockingham 19, Stratum. Uh, I'm here to introduce House Bill 281. Uh, Represent Representative Ames is the co-sponsor of this bill. Uh, this is a very much a bipartisan bill from our work from last year. Another one of those bills that we worked on as a, as a group and, and came to our conclusions. If, if anything, this is a uh, philosophical bill, House versus Senate. The Senate has a different position on this bill and we have one on this bill. Uh, the bill does four things. It amends the tax expenditure, uh, uh, amends which tax expenditures must be reported upon each year within the tax expenditure report. And I'll explain that in a minute. It delays the implementation of single sales factor under the BPT from taxable periods ending on or after December 31st, 2022, which is next year's, so it's not in effect right now, it'll be in effect next year, uh, to periods ending on or after December 31st, 2026. You know, after I, the more I review this bill, uh, that, that may be a little bit for, far out and something we really wanna talk about as we, we proceed here. The third thing is for that period, meaning the, the that the period between 22 and 26 we reverts back to the bill also reverts us back to the apportionment methodology being used for tax tax uh, periods that uh, ended on or after or on uh, December 31st, 2021, which is really this year's current methodology, which for the first time includes market-based sourcing. Okay. That's all important to know that this is the first time this year that we, we're including market-based sourcing. I'm gonna explain what market-based sourcing is in a minute. And the four, final thing it does is it, it, it amends the duties of a legislative com commission on apportionment. So let's pause a minute and talk about apportionment. Uh, what is apportionment and why is it needed? So if you, you owned a business in New Hampshire and you only did business in New Hampshire. You only had brick and mortar in New Hampshire. You had employees employed here and you only sold in New Hampshire your product. You wouldn't have to worry about apportionment because it'd be 100% of, of your profits would be taxed under New Hampshire law. But that's not what most businesses, even smaller businesses do have a reach into even the surrounding states like Maine and Massachusetts, Vermont. So uh, bigger companies have a reach across the country and internationally as well. So th there needs to be a way of apportioning the profits of a business across all the states that they, they in one way or another do some business in or have a, a presence in. So that's what apportionment is. So let's talk about the history of apportionment. Years and years ago, uh, and it, it was very simple. Most states all use the same methodology. They use the one, one 
the, the formula was based on one third of where your sales were, were one, one third on where your tangible property wa was, and one third of where your payroll was. And basically each, each state used the same methodology. So it was a pretty fair and consistent approach to apportionment. Now, with time though, many states started to gain this and they decided that how can we maximize the revenue coming to our state? And uh, for those of you, and I remember when I was first heard about this, I said, well, why, why isn't there a uniform approach across all states? The federal government has stayed away from this question. The only way that would happen is if they decided to have a law that says that the states will have the same uh, formulas. Uh, but th there's no directive from the federal government on this, just in case you're curious. Even New Hampshire, uh, a while back, took the step of changing that one third, one third, one third by doubling up on the sales portion of it. So, not this uh, currently, including tax period this year, our apportionment is one half on sales, one quarter on tangible property, and one quarter on payroll. So let me let me pause here and just touch on the the first uh, point of the bill, or uh, which is the expenditure report. And then we're gonna go back to the history here. Uh, so this, this thing called a tax expenditure report that the DRA puts out every year. And we, in the Ways and Means, take a look at that. Several years ago, uh, they presented, and I asked, uh, I asked the question, because if you go to, if you go to the bill, uh, that section is on uh, page one, lines three to 10. It basically is the language of, of the, what's required of the expenditure report. And you can see we took out, uh, we crossed out the weighted apportionment factors under RSA 77. That was put in years ago to monitor when we want to double, sale, double, sales, double sales. And it, it got to a point where no one was really looking down at me. We wanted to monitor the progress of that. And it was the side I said, we really don't need it anymore. I was the fellow who filed the bill, simple bill, the original bill was just to get rid of that sales file, that, that piece in the expenditure report. Now, it'll become clear that that bill became the vehicle, that bill became the vehicle for other things as time marched on here. So, so let me continue. Now, I'm trying to piece this all together. About three or four years ago, we received the Senate bill uh, that was filed by uh, Senator Burtzel. Uh, something about forming a commission to study market-based sourcing. And the reason she filed it is she had a constituent. constituent. We'll just call him Al. Well, Al had a business that brokered food across the country but all his business was based in New Hampshire. And market-based sourcing has to do with services. How do, you, how do you apportion services like his, where he's a broker, but he brokers his product to other states. It's, that, that, and let's use turkeys, because that's, that's how you get food. So he would, he would buy turkeys in, in the Carolinas and sell it to supermarkets in, in, uh, in Maine. The reason I'm using Maine is you have to see why in a minute. So, so we, uh, so we had this, we had this commission, we had this commission that was uh, made up of, uh, of a variety of people. I'll get to that in a minute. But here's the difference between what we do, we were doing and what we do now. We did cost of performance. And what cost of performance is, is where the service is performed gets the tax benefit. So New Hampshire, it was where the people doing the brokering in this case, or if you're a computer company, were doing from their offices in New Hampshire, but providing service to another state, or a company in another state, all of that tax was apportioned to New Hampshire. What happened to Al uh, several years ago is that Maine, went to market-based sourcing. So what's market-based sourcing? Where the benefit is where, market-based sourcing 
emphasizes where the benefit is received. The person, the, the 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 state that in which the be, the company is that receives the benefit is is where the tax benefit goes. So it's just the opposite. So what happened was there there was Al minding his own business and he gets a tax notice from Maine saying you owe us all this back taxes because you're doing business with this company in Maine receiving your turkeys, okay? And you didn't pay taxes because we got market-based sourcing. And, and our law says that you, you owe us money. So, uh, so, so there's a situation where both Al, uh, Al, you know, New Hampshire collected a tax from him and Maine collected a tax. He was double taxed for this. So what happened was we did form this commission. Representative Major and I were on it. Uh, Representative Lovejoy uh, was on it. Uh, Representative Almey would, would stop by and, and try to attend as many meetings. We also had Senator uh, D'Alessandro and Berkso chaired. Uh, we had Commissioner Step on it. But we also had I, what I would characterize as probably the two of the best, uh, one of the uh, two of the best tax accountants and tax lawyers in the state on this commission uh, to go through this. We actually extended this commission to, to make it a year and a half. Uh, we went through it all, and we concluded at the very end that that market based we should go to market based sourcing. So, market based sourcing is now in effect this year. Okay, this taxable year that ends in the periods ending December 31st of 2001 forward are, are we, we are now market-based source, source. So this year for the first time, we'll be out from under being double taxed. That's all fine and good. But what, where a lot of our conversation was is to, for us to go to market-based sourcing, the DRA has to identify businesses, and let's just use Maine to be simple, all over the country, but let's say Maine, it has to go and find all those companies in Maine that are providing services to New Hampshire. Let's say a computer company, okay, that does software uh, or just, you know, just so, but they never set foot in New Hampshire, but they're, they're providing service to companies in New Hampshire. We have to find all those, those companies. So that's, that's important because this is part of our reasoning about wanting to swallow up single sale factor. Uh, and we'll, we'll get to that. So, uh, but the other thing in that commission, we did touch on briefly at the end on single sales factor. And, and there were two senators on this, three, three house members. We, we agreed not to touch single, single sales factor for a while. All right, so what happened? Uh, all right, that's what I, I lost my spot here. So where are we today? So what happened was last budget, uh, which was, uh, let's go back to 2019. The budget, it was a budget, the budget was vetoed uh last year if you recall uh, there were three months of, of downtime then there was compromise and in the compromise you know one of the last things stuck in there by the senate without hearings for us was single sales factor okay now to appease us they put uh, they created a, a, a joint committee, three, three house members, four house members, three senators. And they were supposed to meet twice. And then they, they were supposed to vote. They were supposed to vote uh, whether to rescind this, this single sales tax. Okay. Again, then the virus hit. There was, they never met the first time. And then when they tried, and Representative Romney, you can chime in later about this, but my understanding is that uh, this all blew up in a technicality, that it was basically against our rules to have a committee rescind 
something in the budget without going to the House floor or the Senate floor. It was it wasn't allowed, although it was in the it was it was in what we all thought we were going to do. So so what what happened was uh, it, right now as we sit here, single sales factor is coming in um, uh, for the taxable periods ending December. Uh, uh, beginning on or after December 31st of 2022. So what this legis uh, legislation does is, is we're basically reversing that. We, we're saying we want to delay that. And why do we want to delay that? Uh, again, The real thing here is that, that we want to delay it to, to let single the market-based sourcing settle in for that one year, and then and then have a baseline of what happened to the our business revenues, and then give us time to get more. And then we're also giving time for the DBRA's computer system to do its thing, the new computer system we talked about, so we get more information on it. So we want to buy some time. It isn't like we're against single sales factor. We just don't want to go on blindly. The reason we don't, I say we, this is, I'm, I'm speaking for the for the uh, committee of ways and means from last year, not this, this one, but last year we, we were concerned that if we make a mistake on this one, it could be a major mistake. You got to understand that, what it, oh, I didn't explain what single sales factor is. Single sales factor is you, you take away where the people are, you take away where the plant is, and you're left with your portion simply on sales. So if your sales are out of state, the out of state uh, uh, <coughs> state gets the credit for it. Not, not so when you look at our upside down triangle for business taxes. We have a lot of large companies that, re that represent most of our poor profit, our profit stacks. And what, what we're concerned about is a lot of them are manufacturers. When you look at the biggest ones like uh, BAE, uh, they're narrowly, you know, they don't sell here. They sell, you know, to all over the country. So where we are concerned about what the impact this is going to be. Other states, because one thing we grappled with in the commission was data. We want data. I know with the major, we want data to see what, what this is going to do to us. Unfortunately, the data we really want is very hard to get at. Okay. Um, so, so we want to be cautious. Other states, when we asked about how, how did other states decide to jump in, no data, they just decided to jump in. So, uh, but so all those other states have an income tax and a sales tax. This is our major tax, business tax. As we did real final the last two weeks. So we're just trying to be a little cautious here. We're, gonna, we're, we're making an attempt uh, to, to uh, slow this down a bit so that we can actually evaluate the impact of this. I don't think the play is going to be here in the House. It's really going to be against the Senate. Uh, because the senators are going to have to agree with this vote now. Now, I had a call, a Zoom meeting yesterday. His uh, Bill Ardinger, one of the probably one of the top tax guys in the state, uh, reached out to me. He set up a Zoom. I was on schedule. He was he, he was he was saying, "Oh, you got to really do this guy. You you got to reel it sales to sales factor go forward." And I said, I explained to him, you know, we're in the house, we're a little more cautious than that. Um, but what he said, and I, what was passed us on, is that 30 states have done this now. So is it just a matter of time before New Hampshire does it? Probably yes. I mean, 30 states. Um, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure if we're surrounded by a single sales factor. We'll find that out right now. Um, so again, this is our attempt to slow it down a bit, uh, this bill. Uh, the other thing the bill does is it, it that, that, that committee, that joint committee, we 
uh, reactivated it and said, let us, it'll be a committee that monitors uh, the progress of uh, market-based sourcing and going forward. So that's the big picture of what's going on. And, um, and I'll take questions. Representative Major, I like data. Just like you, I like data. Question. Um, Thank you. My hand is up, and you'd also said that maybe I should say something as well. Representative Allen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, this is just historical at this point, but on um, that special committee, uh, was told during we were told during the budget negotiations that uh, it was constitutional for that special committee to uh, remove the part of the budget that was about single sales factor. Uh, six months later, the same person told us that it was not constitutional and we couldn't do it. Or three months later, whatever it was. No, it was a year. Uh, so. So anyway, we are, what we're trying to do is what we really wanted to do back when we did the special committee, which was to, to delay it so that we can have the time to know how much money we're going to lose. It seems highly likely we are going to lose revenue over this because we are an elderly state. We consume less than other states. And we have a very large number of manufacturers for our size, and they almost all sell most, almost entirely outside the state. So they would not be paying business profits tax. Uh, if this happens, they'd only be paying BET. And, um, but on that, we, we need the bill both to find out how much we would lose because all those other states have changed over. We're, we're going to have major double taxation issues. We're going to have to do something at some point, but to find out what's going on. And the reason it goes to 2026 is that on um, the DRA in orientation told us that they had just, they were just finishing bringing out a new online tax system they also have a tax uh, analysis system that is in place now. We had very bad data 10 years ago, even a huge, very bad data 10 years ago. And um, this will bring us up uh, to par with most other states, at least. Um, and, but it is only going online for the business taxes this year. We are starting market-based sourcing this year. So we don't know what market-based sourcing is going to do to these revenues. Um, and we can't distinguish the businesses that are selling until this year. We can't distinguish the businesses that are selling mostly out of state from the rest of them in order to be able to do an analysis. And I think DRA can say this better than I can, um, but it's going to take two good years of complete data and we won't have be mostly complete until a year after the tax year that we're talking about. So that takes us to middle 25, which means that we'd have to pass a bill for 26. So um, I see that we've got Carolyn and Melissa up and I'm gonna stop talking, thank you. Well, thank you, Carol. Uh, Representative, Representative Major, can I say something? Can I say something? Quick, because I'd like to get to the DRA. Go ahead. Uh, I'm still going to see. <laughs> so, uh, what, I, what I told, interestingly enough, is we probably signed up for the DRA. You know, what was missing last year was that the Senate, I don't even know if the Senate had hearings on this, but we like to have hearings. I told Bill Harden, you, you, you get your companies, if you think this is a great idea, we want to hear from you. I want to know what the Senate was told. I want to know what the government was told. Uh, we have no idea what, what they were told. And uh, they should come and testify before us as to what, 
what made them think that this was risk free, if you will. Uh, so that, that's basically my position. I think most of us had agreed last year. So, thank you. I think before we go to questions, I'd like to get the GRA to have their input and then we'll go to questions. Okay. So, uh, from the DRA, we have both uh, Carolyn and Melissa. Do you both want to join or one? Want to listen from the DRA? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, Melissa Rollins again with New Hampshire Department of Revenue. And with me online also is Karen, Carolyn Lear, Assistant Commissioner for the Department of Revenue. Thank you, Representative Abrami, for doing such a great job of explaining this bill, as well as being supplemented by Representative Almi, uh, making my job a little bit easier. So I'm going to cover Section 1 first, just to get that part out of the way, um, because it's sort of quick and easy. Representative Abrami, you covered this well. The Section 1 of this bill is really just removing um, the statute for weighted apportionment factor under the tax expenditure report statute for a report that typically takes us a few hours to complete yet really doesn't have any valid information anymore. So it's swapping that out with a now more valid statute for a new credit, regional career and technical education credit, adding that to the statute so we can make sure we meet our statutory oblig obligation and report that each year. So we, we really like that part of the statute. Um, now on to market-based sourcing and single sales factor. Again, I think Representative Abrami did a great job explaining this statute. Again, just as a high level to hit it again for the new members. Um, cost of performance is where we are at last year. We just started with market-based the beginning of this year. So, you know, 27 days ago. Um, so cost of performance, again, is that when it's intangible sales and services are apportioned based on where the services was performed, right? And now switching to market-based sourcing starting this year, it's where those intangible sales and services are now apportioned to where the end customer is. So that's the biggest difference there. So the timing for this, switching those single sales out and pushing the date out is really like Representative Abrami said, is to give time for a report to be done and really analyze that full impact of market, um, market-based sourcing. I think again, Representative Almi also alluded to this, with market-based sourcing, you're now sort of switching your customer base. So you're pulling in new customers based on those sales being to the end customer. We didn't have those before. So we're pulling in this new customer base that we didn't have previously. And we're also losing some because it's people who were now based at where they perform and they only outsource um, outside of New Hampshire, we're losing those. And there's no way for us to identify that fiscal impact at this point. So in order to get a fiscal impact, we really need the implementation um, pushed out some before single sales comes in. With current law, having single sales start is fine. We can administer that, yet it does um, sort of make the situation a little bit murky because you have these new taxpayers and now they're filing single sales and we don't know which impact is due to which apportionment change. So it does sound like it's pushed out far when we say December 31st, 2026. However, it's important to note that a tax year doesn't complete until two years later. And that's because of fiscal year filers. So we won't have, for just market-based sourcing alone, we won't have a complete tax year on market-based sourcing until August of 2023. And that will be our first year. And then it adds another year in there to sort of get us that compliance going of getting those new taxpayers on board to file market-based sourcing. So then when we can file our anticipated report, which is in section three of the bill, which is due November 1st, 2024, we now have relevant data because at that point we should have the bulk of these market-based sourcing taxpayers into our system and we can do that analysis to say, hey, what would it look like now if we switched from that three-factor apportionment, which we are currently at, again, payroll, property, double-weighted sales, where we switch it over to that uh, single sales factor. 
So that's the reason for that push out. And then it gives you time to implement the bill and see what the um, fiscal impact is and decide if you, if you want that bill. I think I covered everything I wanted, but happy to answer any questions if I miss something. Now that we've heard from the three experts, um, do we have any questions? Panelists? From the attendees? Wow, you guys have done a great job. There's no question. <laughs> uh, if I'm correct, I don't see any hands. Don't keep looking. So, uh, <laughs> cool. there, there is one, head, right? one name on the blue sheet. Eric Rockbaum, representing himself, and he supports the bill. Since there's nobody else here to testify for or against the bill. In your example, you used a, a hypothetical gentleman named Al. What <clears> happens <throat> to Al if we defer this until 2024? He's a service provider based just in New Hampshire. His facility is in New Hampshire, and his employees are in New Hampshire. So he won't be impacted by the other two factors. But plus, he's a service. He's, he's, he's really impacted by market resources and not by the others. In other words, he doesn't have facility in other states, and he doesn't have employees working in other states, which are the other two factors. Right. So he's basically sales, but he's he's a different kind of sale in that he's he's uh, service. He's combining services. Sales of service. Essentially, where he was paying taxes for two states, now he doesn't pay the taxes for two states. He'll, he'll, pay, he'll pay taxes in Maine, he'll pay no taxes in New Hampshire. This is the kind of thing we get nervous about. But he won't pay, if we go to, right now he's paying some taxes in New Hampshire. But, but we go to a single sales factor, he won't be paying any. Is that, is that correct? It's, it's a little bit hard for me to hear, so I couldn't hear the original question or the response. Sorry about that. We remember Al. We all remember Al, right? He yes. Was, so um, his, his business is a service business. All his facility is based in, in New Hampshire, the building. His employees are all in New Hampshire. And... Uh, and he, but he sells to other states without the product. He's buying another from other states, selling the product. Never stuck the, the product. Never touched the base in New Hampshire. It goes. He's just a broker. So the question is, if will single sales going the single sales factor impact him? I think it will. Oh, he will. He'll pay no tax in New Hampshire. Well, he'll pay the apportionment. He'll pay the apportionment. Well, he will any of the apportionment in that scenario. Okay, he, he's a service company uh, with all his physical plant here and all his payroll here. What will happen to his taxes? And from New Hampshire. Hi, Representative, Representative Abrami. This is Carolyn Lear, Assistant Commissioner at the Department of Revenue. I think certainly single sales factor would impact um, this hypothetical taxpayer who has um, New Hampshire employees and property, because currently his um, tax base is in part being dictated by his New Hampshire um, employees and property. That makes up two thirds of how we calculate his tax liability. Going forward, single sales factor would be the only way we would um, calculate his New Hampshire tax liability. So his New Hampshire um, employees and property would no longer um, dictate his overall tax liability. Um, that being said, I think the unfairness that this hypothetical taxpayer was um, concerned with initially was mostly the market-based sourcing versus cost of performance inconsistency among the states and not so much the um, sales factor. But to follow up uh, with that, um, 
basically he wouldn't be paying any tax in New Hampshire, correct? If we want to single sales tax him? If a taxpayer who has no, um, no clients in the state and is providing services to, you know, if their business is the provision of services to clients and his clients are all right. not New Hampshire states, he probably does not have a liability in New Hampshire under single sales factor. It's a two tier thing for Al. His problem was solved when he went to my source. <laughs> and now we're not very really sure about but we know that we affect him from the same process. It will affect us. Right. right. We're going to lose that revenue. And we want to know how many owls are out there. How many owls are out there in New Hampshire that are going to not have that liability, but also how many SAMs are out there from other states that are going to, that we can tax? Okay, now that's done now. Could, could I just? Another question. Yes, thank you. Um, so I couldn't remember. He wouldn't have to pay BET either. So he would be paying nothing at state level, only his property tax uh, to, to take care of his employees, to take care of his public safety, to take care of a whole range of other government services that he uses in the state. He'd be paying them to Maine. I was just turning into the discussion, Mr. Chair, but uh, Melissa, our, our uh, club, uh, would, would, would uh, he would, he has employees here, so he would probably still be paying some DEP, wouldn't he? Right. Uh, a taxpayer who has employees in the state would still pay the BET. Um, apportionment doesn't really impact that tax. It's only the BPT. Always pay the BPT. Must they? Yeah, you're always pay. If there are any other questions, if not, then I'm going to close the public hearing on House Bill 281. Yeah. Thank everybody for spending the time, both virtually and in person. Have a good night. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you.